Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to this webinar. The first webinar of the Italian Society for Surgery of the Hand involves the opposite corners of the world in these tough times of COVID. Just a few words of welcome from the president of the Italian Society for Surgery of the Hand. And uh, good evening everyone. Uh, as president of the Italian Society of Hand Surgery, it is a real pleasure for me uh, to be virtually here with the, all of you. And I thank you very much for your participation in this meeting. But uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, guidelines committee uh, for, uh, of our society, and particularly Dr. Andrea Azzei. Was, uh, uh, he was able to organize this webinar of great uh, scientific interest in only two days. Uh, indeed, we started talking about this event just last Saturday. And uh, uh, today we have uh, um, friends from Singapore, and China, Hong Kong, South Korea, United Kingdom, and Spain, together with many Italian colleagues uh, representing the region, particularly affected by the coronavirus pandemic. I'm sure that the discussion will be of great interest because we will clarify, clarify many aspects of this phenomenon and in particular how we will have to behave in this phase in which all clinical activities will uh, gradually get back to normality. Uh, now I wish to offer participants a good and a fruitful webinar and I pass the mic to the chairman, Dr. Andrea Zetti. Mi ricordo la parola in italiano per i colleghi, eh, eh, cari colleghi vi saluto tutti, buonasera, eh, buon pomeriggio, eh, in qualità di Presidente dello Stato Italiano di Chirurgia della Mano, oh, per me è un piacere essere qui virtualmente con tutti voi e vi ringrazio per la vostra partecipazione a questo meeting, eh, ma eh, un ringraziamento particolare va alla Commissione eh, di guida della nostra società e in particolare ad Andrea Zei che mi ha proposto eh, questo eh, webinar e L'abbiamo organizzato in pochissimi giorni. Eh, pensate che ne abbiamo parlato eh, esattamente sabato scorso. Oggi ci sono eh, molti amici eh, stranieri, vengono da Singapore, Cina, Hong Kong, Sud Corea, eh, Inghilterra e Spagna, ma anche molti nostri colleghi italiani che eh, lavorano soprattutto nelle aree, nelle regioni dove la pandemia coronavirus eh, è stata particolarmente eh, rappresentata. Sono sicuro che da questa discussione oggi, che è di grande interesse, eh, avremo dei chiarimenti su alcuni aspetti di questo fenomeno. E in particolare, capire che noi siamo può portarci eh, per la ripresa di queste attività che gradualmente ormai ricominceranno. Vi ringrazio tutti, quindi, e vi auguro una, una buona webinar. E quindi passo la parola ad Andrea che continuerà con, uh, con questo webinar. Grazie a tutti. It's my great pleasure to co chair this webinar with uh, Bo Liu and Andrew Chin. Uh, this program now, uh, which is pretty, pretty tight, I would like to introduce quickly my, my colleagues. Andrew is a senior consultant of the Department of Hand and Reconstruction Microsurgery at the Singapore General Hospital and he's also associate professor at the National University of Singapore and Duke NHS School of Medicine. Andrew is a good friend. Uh, he gave me a, a good heart to organize uh, this meeting uh, today along with Bo Liu. Bo Liu is a consultant hand surgeon of the Department of Hand Surgery at the Beijing Jin Shui Tan Hospital and uh, is also associate professor at the University of Beijing. Please, Andrew, can you tell us about the, the other speakers? All right, uh, we uh, have a lineup of uh, speakers from uh, Asia. Uh, we're trying to get some uh, representation, especially in countries where this COVID uh, pandemic has been uh, one of the hardest hit areas, namely uh, China, South Korea, Singapore, and uh, well, Hong Kong. Uh, but Hong Kong is having a rather hot. Uh, at this point in time, so we also want to hear from them how they how they maintain such a good uh, number. Uh, from uh, Hong Kong will be Alex as well as uh, Margaret Falk, uh, who will be representing uh, Hong Kong. And uh, from South Korea, we have uh, uh, a huge...
Mm-hmm. And uh, from China, we have Bodio together with me. Uh, we'll be giving our experience for uh, on this uh, uh, this COVID epidemic uh, and pandemic and how we deal with the uh, current situation at this point in time. And for some of us, we are still under lockdown, uh, like Singapore, whereas some are already out of uh, uh, lock, lockdown and they are reopening uh, things like China and Hong Kong and even South Korea. So uh, later on, uh, the rest of them will be sharing their experiences and how that we can actually brace ourselves for phase two, which is the reopening phase. Right? And uh, without further ado, I will want to uh, hand over this uh, session to uh, Bo Liu, who will start off with the, um, his, his lecture on the Chinese perspective on uh, how, how they deal with uh, this uh, pandemic and uh, how, how they are now in this uh, state of uh, reopening uh, in dealing with uh, life, hopefully back to the new normal. Uh, Bo Liu. Thank you, Andrew. Bo? Thank, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, uh, uh, Andrew, for your kind uh, introduction. So, uh, I'm glad to be the first speaker about uh, talking about some, some uh, Asian experience. Uh, like uh, you, everyone knows that uh, in Asia, many countries like China, Singapore, Korea, also regions like Hong Kong, we actually uh, got attack of this uh, crisis uh, about two months before the rest of the world. And also, unfortunately, we also have a, another severe attack of, of SARS back to uh, 2002. So, uh, and uh, fortunately, we got some we, lessons uh, learned in SARS uh, more than 10 years ago. So this time we have a better opportunity to uh, act more uh, quicker. And uh, hopefully we, we can uh, deal with situation uh, before the rest of the world. So uh, in my uh, presentation, I like to, to just uh, go through some uh, general things. Uh, some uh, actually is uh, national-based or society-based uh, measures that uh, are dealing with what we are dealing with the uh, pandemic. And our, our colleagues in, uh, in actually Hong Kong, Korea, and Singapore, uh, actually we are talking about more detail in how to deal in the hand surgery during the pandemic. So this is a, uh, what, had, what uh, the uh, existing cases in China nowadays, you can see in, there are 30 provinces in China actually more than half of the province actually has uh, is now is zero, zero. and uh, I worked in Beijing here. Actually, is a uh, is a uh, uh, mega city, but the cases now is uh, below one hundred. So uh, you can see the uh, the uh, peak has already gone, and we already goes to the second phase. So the current situation in China. We, uh, the Wuhan city, which is the uh, most uh, attacked city, was reopened in, in 8 April. And in 30 April, the natural hazard response level downgrade to level two response throughout the country. What, what means level two response? That means we gradually reopen the kindergartens and the schools. And the cinemas, museums are expected to reopen at early June. One of the prerequisites for all the families who can resume their uh, full workload, including the surgeons, is like this. So, this is a reopen of the kindergartens. And hygiene, disinfection. Okay, this is the current situation in China. Actually, uh, you can see most many of the things actually has a back to the normal. For the hospitals, emergency service provided all the time throughout the crisis, not stopping. Our patient clinic reopened about two months ago already. 
and elective surgery were restarted two, more than two months ago, or more than one month ago, sorry. Not strict uh, uh, scrutination before admission and full protection measures were taken for the medical staff as well as the uh, paramedical personnel. So, saying so uh, when a patient entering a hospital, we need some several things need to be done. First, step one is uh, when they enter in the hospital, all the patient or relatives need to wear a face mask before entering any building of the hospital. And temperature measurement has entered of the hospital, institutions, and the individual clinics. The patient with fever will go to fever clinic for screening. So this is a fever clinic system. We actually started from SARS back in 2002. And now it's a mandatory for all hospitals in China. And it's, it should be uh, in an isolated building away from other building in a hospital. And the personal medical, uh, professional medical staff for screening any contagious disease is happening in these isolated clinics in a hospital. So the step two is when the patient is, uh, is there's no fever, he, he, can, he or she can enter in an outpatient clinic building. Before entering the building, a smartphone alarming system actually is conducted. Everyone needs to scan the QC code on their smartphones and big data analysis supported by the telecommunication operators and the airlines training service. This will uh, uh, show their level of risk. Only one with green, green code can be allowed to go to the outpatient clinic directly. This app actually has helped the government or the society to relax lockdown measures across the country. So you can see that this is a smartphone alarming system is, has a three different levels of risk and safety based on big data analysis. Red is considered as a high risk, yellow as moderate, and green as low. This is some, if someone has uh, been to a, a prevalence country or area or has close contact with the confirmed cases, it will have to show the uh, color of the yellow and the green. So if the patient has a uh, show a green, uh, he, he or she can allow to enter in our patient clinic directly. But if in yellow and the red and the need to go to a separate area like a fever clinic for a rapid COVID-19 screening test with a history and uh, with history and physical uh, as well as a throat strap. And also this smartphone is, app is useful for individuals in the society or community to, to see or check the location of the confirmed patient found in your city, in your community. And the step two is uh, entering the outpatient clinic building. We use uh, indoor temperature screening because uh, the outdoor temperature screening could be in incorrect. So this is a second step uh, temperature screening with a uh, like uh, automatic screening uh, uh, security uh, door or manual check. So the uh, step three is uh, after the patient has a green code, can go to the nurse station. He has he or she may have the good, uh, has the uh, pre consultation. The nurse will use uh, uh, also a smartphone to have a double check of the. Uh, uh, recent travel or contact history and uh, check the uh, manually if the patient has a con con uh, respiratory symptoms. And with any alarming signs, they will be moved to a separate area for rapid screening as well. You can see uh, from the first uh, step number one to three, actually, uh, the patient, when the patient comes to the clinic to see the doctor, the patient can be thought to be a quite safe patient. So the, the, the pressure for the doctors in the clinic is actually is very, very low. So in the OPD building, the uh, fashion face mask is required for everyone, and the social distance is uh, uh, suggested for everyone. You can see if the patient is a uh, uh, yellow uh, coat, that means he had travel history to countries and locations which has a high risk. And red suggests he is a suspect, uh, as a confirmed or suspected uh, case. So uh, if the patient is a uh, uh, is a suspected, uh, highly uh, suspected or confirmed case, he, he will 
sent to a, uh, as an aided hospital for further treatment with supporting surgeon in there to, to do the all kind of surgery, including hand surgery in that hospital, not in every hospital. So if the patient has a, a yellow coat, you need to go to a separate area for screening. So everyone we're talking about the privacy issue is it's, this is true, there's a lot of debate uh, on this. So actually in this uh, AF, there's no details showing the smartphone, just three colors shown. We don't really know the detail of why someone categorized into red or into yellow. Only in public health specialist or contagious, or we call contagious detective, has temporary access to someone's travel contact history during the crisis, you know, during the crisis stage. Meanwhile, the online clinic uh, actually is keep going. This is my personal online clinic. The patient can find this uh, QR code and scan it by his smartphone to find me online. And the patient has a text, consultation, audio, consultation, that means telephone, and the video consultation that like face-to-face examination. This is, actually, this is, uh, this term system has uh, been built several years ago. This is my, this is my personal, uh, Online clinic, you can see, has a, already has a, uh, six million uh, times of the visits of my clinics uh, this several years. Okay, for so we have started elective surgery uh, about one month, more than one month ago. So before any admission of elective case, three uh, prerequisites: blood test. Uh, search flag and the low dose CT scan is mandatory for every patient who admit to the ward. And this is a canteen in the operating room. You can see this is last year we have a very happy gathering in the operating room, but now we need to sit in the same direction. <laughs> we do not allow face to face uh, eating. You can see uh, this is a different setting. And teaching and group study also continue. This is before. And this is uh, actually is yesterday we are talking about uh, replantation cases uh, to teach our uh, young fellows and uh, uh, and young doctors. So emergency cases is a more complicated uh, because uh, we do not have enough time to screen all the patients. The temp of, but we still need to uh, temperature measuring, QR code checking and a consultation with contact history and respiratory symptoms. And the partners or the relatives uh, uh, should be experiencing the same uh, circuit. And the negative long uh, CT, uh, no dose CT scan is also mandatory for emergency cases. If infection cannot be ruled out, an urgent treatment must be taken. Protection level should be in This is a, in an emergency case for the patient with a medium risk. We use a 95 mask and a face shield or kudos and a flash proof disposable gun is mandatory for these for surgeons and nurses in this room. And this is a, a high risk for high risk patients. We we need to do the surgery in a separate operation room in a separate building. This, this separate operating room is isolated from other operating rooms. Uh, full protection clothing and the 95 mask and face chair, you go as well. Yes. Okay, so uh, for the uh, patient of surgery, if the fever uh, irrelevant with the trauma has occurred or uh, present with the respiratory uh, comorbidities, that should be aroused. So we re examine lung CT and surface swabbing and isolate the patient into the single room in the ward. If necessary, if it is conformed to a positive patient, we have transport the patient to a specialized uh, ward or hospitals. Okay, this is roughly what we have done in China, and my friend will give the more details in the, uh, in the following uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bo. Oh, thank you, Bulio, for a wonderful talk. Wonderful talk. Before Andrew starts his own presentation, I would like to 
thank again uh, Bo and you for the big help and the, the commitment to share all this knowledge um, that they had since many years of working in this in this field with very dangerous situation and uh, I would like to remember the participants that if you have any questions you can uh, type that on the chats either on YouTube or in Zoom you can type your questions uh, on the chat so thank you Andrew for your uh, presentation go ahead thank you Okay, so next, our next speaker will be on, uh, our coach, uh, Andrew Ching from the Singapore General Hospital. Andrew, please. Right, thank you. Thank you, Bo. And thank you, uh, Andre, for the kind invitation for me to co-chair this meeting. And allow, uh, allow me to share with you uh, the Singapore's perspective on uh, managing uh, such patients during the pandemic. Um, compared to China, of 1.3 billion people, we are only 5.5 million, so uh, we are not even uh, the size of Beijing. So, but we have uh, quite a challenging time because, first of all, we are a small country and we have, it's very densely populated and also we have, uh, I would say, um, quite, quite interesting uh, scenarios that happen uh, and uh, our numbers are going up uh, for uh, for this period of time because of the um, mass outbreak in the foreign dormitories, which I will elaborate a little bit further. Okay, so, after the SARS epidemic in 2003, Singapore has come up with this uh, disease outbreak response system condition, or what we call DOSCON. So, in a normal uh, situation is usually green and uh, we step up to yellow uh, in January uh, when uh, China had the first uh, wave and uh, we actually started uh, being very um, vigilant about it and uh, people are starting to get on guard and uh, hospitals and even uh, a lot of uh, sectors are actually preparing for this uh, outbreak and uh, it was September oh, sorry uh, 7 of February we uh, went on to escalate into orange and now we are still at orange where it's a severe uh, but it's not widespread in Singapore at this point in time and of course there's moderate, moderate disruption and now with this uh, uh, partial lockdown in our country so the life is also a little bit more okay, so, uh, okay. so I just want to give you a brief uh, this, uh, this uh, table which outlined the crucial period of uh, this COVID infection in Singapore, as you can see, the first wave started in January, late January, when we had our first case on 23rd of January. And usually, uh, these uh, cases uh, are from visitors coming in from the COVID affected regions. All right. And uh, just over one month, we achieved 100 to 100 case. And at this period of time, uh, there was no death at all. And uh, we escalated from Noscon or yellow to uh, orange on the 7th of February. Uh, then comes the second wave from mid-March to mid-April, where you can see actually from 29th of February to 1st of April, the first over one month, we have escalated the cases tenfold, from 100 to 1,000. And uh, this is attributed to overseas uh, citizens and residents returning, uh, even uh, overseas fellows are uh, asked to return to Singapore. And uh, some of these uh, people actually have contracted uh, COVID-19 in the countries that they were working in or studying in. So uh, you can see at uh, this period of time, we experienced the first death in Singapore on 22nd of March and the 10th death uh, uh, slightly uh, over three weeks uh, uh, in, uh, on 15th of, of April. Then it comes to the third wave. Uh, this is what we are currently at, in at this point in time. And we have a massive increase in number of cases. You can see from from 1st of April, 1,000 to 6th of May, just after one month, we have shot from 1,000 to 20,000 cases. So it's actually an exponential climb in the number of cases. That's also because we have ramped up in our testing and we are getting more and more cases reported. And most of the cases that are reported are found in the foreign workers' dormitories where, they are, where there's a, a mass of outbreaks there. And uh, up to this stage, we only recorded 20 deaths since 6th of May, he's the last last person to, 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 uh, to uh, be recorded date, and this is the 20th case. 
Okay, so and um, so what is the most important thing that's out in my, our mind now? Because our lockdown is until the 1st of June. It's been extended from 4th of May to 1st of June. So as we see some countries like China and South Korea who have already um, started to reopen and uh, life is going back to almost normal, we just want to find out how they manage and we are watching them very closely to see if there's a possible resurgence of uh, community spread depending on how they reopen. And also uh, the statisticians have actually forecasted that we actually hit 40,000 cases by the end of this month. So you can see right now we are just hovering over 21,000 and uh, they are expecting another almost 20,000 cases to hit us by the end of this month. So it's actually quite a big number. But hopefully the number of deaths will remain low. So it actually reflects on the, uh, first of all, the, the, the type of patients we have. You can see the majority of the cases are actually found in the young uh, who are in the, in the dormitories between the ages of uh, 20 to 49, right? And the high risk age groups, uh, we, most of the deaths are occurring uh, for those patients above 70, but of course we have uh, one or two cases which are in the, in the healthy or the low risk age group, but the uh, majority of them are still in the, the high risk uh, age group of uh, above 70. All right, so we can see many cases in recent week, and more than 90% of them are actually from the dormitories. Local population now, the good thing is that we only have a single uh, digit daily occurrence which means to say that our partial lockdown uh, or what we call the circuit breaker measures have been effective. And we have ramped up testing, especially in the dormitories, which is why we are getting the high numbers of cases. Extensive and enhanced contact tracing for our local transmission is being done to keep the numbers low so that the local uh, population is uh, well under control. And the uh, good thing about it is that we have a low death rate of less than 0.1%. Like I said, most of them are in the lowish age group, mild, and a very high recovery rate. And the key thing to this whole thing is that hospital capacity is not overstressed. So in Singapore, we are very fortunate that our hospitals are still able to cope with the current situation. All right, so what are the guiding principles uh, for the healthcare sector in managing uh, this uh, pandemic? Number one, we will continue to provide quality and optimal patient care Despite this pandemic, right, we have meticulous infection control to protect our staff and patients. Uh, flexibility and adaptability, responsiveness to the ever fluid changes that's happening, right? So we, we, we become creative, we, we invent things to make things easier, make things uh, safer for all the healthcare workers as well as patients. Capacity building and forward planning, right? We are converting a lot of staff to to our big exhibition halls, even court facilities to, to, to become uh, uh, COVID wards for, for patients. And we are also preparing and being proactive to respond to unexpected situations like outbreaks in the dorm. And of course, we are adjusting to new norms. So things like teleconferencing and uh, telemedicine is uh, very interesting now as what Bolu has uh, uh, described earlier on in his uh, lecture. And also not forgetting that uh, how are the strategies being carried out? We want to prioritize manpower and critical assets such as specialists, uh, the doctors like intensivists, infectious disease specialists, internal medicine anesthetists, because these are critical uh, specialists who are actually taking care of the COVID patients. They are right in the front line. Intensive care and critical care units, high dependency areas and theaters, these are also critical assets in the hospitals where we want to preserve them to make sure that, you know, uh, these uh, uh, facilities are available to treat uh, very severe cases. And of course, ventilators and breathing adjuncts such as CPAP and uh, oxygen masks has always been the, something which uh, we want to uh, ensure that uh, we have uh, adequate supply. Rostering and distribution of manpower. So we segregate the teams, whether you're warming on, warming off, multiple self-reliant functional teams important. We split the department into many as many uh, self reliant teams as possible because in case one team is uh, exposed and they are compromised, the rest of the department can still carry on treating and seeing patients. Now, of course, um, some of us are being mobilized to run um, uh, COVID-related duties like swabbing and uh, even uh, looking after COVID patients like you were 
So there's one of our specialists, doctors who are actually been rostered to do duty in these places. And of course, medical logistics and supply chain to ensure that we have enough PPE, drugs, consumables, as well as the equipment that is in tip-top condition. So servicing of equipment is very important as well to make sure everything is well run. All right, so we also want to reconfigure our workflow and our wards, right? Isolation wards are in demand, high dependency wards and uh, ICUs are in demand. And even within the normal wards, we also have physical distancing. So instead of five uh, beds in one room, we are, we are now down to three beds. So there's an increased uh, distancing between patients. And of course, there's always a fixed route or path taken for COVID positive patients within the hospital so that you will not mix or minimize contact with the non COVID patients and staff. Right? As you can see over here. All right, we also want to prioritize patient care. We triage the patient, we right side the patients, and of course, we also deploy the healthcare workers to areas where the most need is required. Okay, so how do we then manage such uh, patients? The aim actually is to provide appropriate and optimal treatment in the shortest possible time with the shortest possible length of stay so as to minimize exposure and infection risk. Right, so throughout this time, only inpatient cares, care uh, uh, for reserve for emergency cases, either life or limb threatening or those very acute cases. Life and limb threatening, of course, you require admission and emergency treatment. Acute cases, you can deal with it in the ambulatory surgery or even in the emergency department, we will try to uh, clear them and discharge them as soon as we can after we have dealt with the, 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 the problem. And of course, for outpatient care, right? Acute cases, of course, we'll still continue to see them and treat them, but stable and chronic cases, we tend to postpone their appointments to much later date. And of course, uh, with this advent of uh, telemedicine, we very much want to explore this option of telemedicine uh, for this kind of patients uh, to be seen face-to-face uh, uh, -face over, over the online platform. Uh, of course, rehabilitation is important. Uh, in fact, initially, uh, the government considered uh, this ally health service uh, non essential until we appealed because we felt it was necessary for holistic recovery of hand surgery patients. So, for post op and acute cases, we tend to, to implement the same uh, kind of uh, strict regime of supervised therapy. And of course, uh, those who require adjuncts like splints and uh, pressure garments. Uh, we also want to make sure that you know, we treat them uh, optimally. But for stable and chronic cases, we tend to postpone their appointment or use teleconsultation uh, platform to actually advise them uh, online. Okay, so what are the changes in practice, especially for now during the lockdown phase as well as the phase two that we are going to go into? Alternative to surgical treatment, so conservative option is very much in, in vogue now. So we advocate uh, things like splinting, casting. Of course, steroid injection is controversial. I think uh, some of our colleagues will be talking on it later, right? And of course, uh, we are using Walan or local anesthesia because uh, hand surgery, we are in a very fortunate stage whereby, uh, whereby most of us actually don't require or most of our patients don't require general anesthesia. So that frees up the ventilators and the anesthetists for other more critical uh, uh, function and use. So we depend very much now on uh, local as well as the wide awake surgery, right? And a uh, decrease in uh, operating theaters as exposure time. All right, so choice of technique is important. Uh, if those who of you who are not very uh, uh, sort of, sort of uh, familiar with uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery, you may opt to just uh, do an open surgery in this case. Aesthetic considerations, of course, may not, may not be uh, possible if you want to uh, decrease the exposure time. Of course, choice of implants, equipment, and sutures, we are, in, we are using uh, more key wires now to, to, uh, to ensure that you know, we deal with the problem a little bit faster. Uh, absorber sutures to minimize the need for suture removals by the clinic staff, so decrease the exposure time. All right, and use of technology such as robots and unmanned machines to actually uh, monitor the patients and also to minimize exposure risks to the staff. Of course, we also use app to cut down interview time as well as unmanned boost to take parameters and telemedicine. Right. All right, so status quo before COVID, these were the happy days. You can see we have so many uh, uh, surgeons 
in one theater, especially for a complicated case where we need to have multiple teams, staff, there's a lot of learning, there are visitors as well. So this was what we had during the times where before COVID uh, took over. But so when during COVID, what, what happens now? There's a redu to reduce infection risk. We have decreased staffing in the theaters, minimum number to perform surgery without compromising care. And of course, decrease, decrease the exposure time, enhance cleaning of the theater in between cases and enhance PPE for suspected or confirmed cases where we actually may need to gown up, use N95 masks, even protect ourselves uh, uh, for, uh, from a possible infection from the COVID. All right. And of course, to free up manpower, we have to cut down our elective list drastically and uh, at one period of time totally and only address time sensitive cases such as trauma, infection, and malignancy. All right. Okay, so phase two. How are we going to deal with phase two? Will life be back to normal to the pre COVID days? I don't think so. We need to accept and adjust to the new norm that we, we think that you know the, the world is going into. And what is the new norm? Restriction of movement, right? Visitors to war are discouraged. Medical students, researchers, vendors providing on site guidance are discouraged at this point in time because of the restriction of movement and the decreasing the number of uh, staff and personnel in the operating theater. Greater reliance on teleconferencing platform is uh, is being emphasized so that you know uh, there are less people uh, in the, the, the theater, but at the same time, there's communication that's ongoing. All right, enhance infection control to minimize risk. So thorough cleansing of theater after each cases, longer turnover time, shorter list, PPE, how extensive do we actually uh, uh, gown up as what we used to do, or do we have uh, enhanced uh, uh, this uh, space suit kind of a situation where we have uh, uh, the, the the ventilators? Uh, I mean, the, I mean the <coughs> air ventilation uh, that that permeates through through the whole body of the surgeon. Of course, risk stratification of patients have to be done. Mandatory pre-op testing for COVID and. Uh, Thanks to Bolio for sharing with us that even lung CT scans are being done now as a screen for COVID for all the elective cases. And of course, uh, this is part of the enhanced workup for patients, especially those with coma, to decrease and increase risk. Right? More stringent indications for surgery, so there's a high threshold for surgery at this point in time rather than low threshold. Uh, less use of certain therapeutics such as steroids and surgery performed only by experts to decrease the exposure, but this will have implications on fellows and residents' hands-on training. And uh, it seems to me that life surgery is probably the way to go in the future as well. So, all right, remote 5G surgery. Uh, I think Bolu can share with us on this uh, remote 5G robotic surgery that we can use, we can consider in time that, that you know, the surgeons will not have to go to hospital, but rather stay at home. Or well, we can do physical distancing surgery like this uh, Dutch uh, Facebook uh, post and uh, how did they manage to do the physical distancing surgery? I'm not too sure, but certainly it's something that you know look in the assessment. Right, so what are the key considerations for phase two? Strong, decisive leadership at national level is important. Competent, respected advisors, right, to be listened to, responsible and cooperative population is very important. And of course, excellent healthcare facilities with well-trained staff and system that's not under stress. Only then can we have gradual and deliberate easing of restrictions, accept new norms as a way of life, and healthcare facilities are able to cope with the elective and non-urgent load, which is what we all aspire to, right? And it will be a very different story, right, if the prolonged epidemic and pandemic due to weak and effective leadership persists, right? And uh, expert and logic advice are not taken seriously. Irresponsible and non-compliant population, right? Untimely and inappropriate reopening. That is the most feared uh, thing that's up in our, all our minds at this point in time, because the consequences will be continued widespread and uncontrolled community spread. Healthcare system and infrastructure that are still overstressed and severely compromised, total economic collapse and anarchy. 
All right, this is not what we want to aspire to. So, for those of you who want to uh, read up more, uh, there is an article that is just published in the May 2020 uh, edition of the IFSSH Easy Magazine. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, quoted by some of my colleagues who we actually uh, will give you a greater detail on how to manage uh, uh, our patients and how does it impact our specialty as a whole in Singapore. With that, I thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew. Amazing presentation. Can you please stop sharing your screen? Okay, thank you. Excellent presentation indeed. And um, so you, you're introducing the next speaker from South Korea, aren't you? Yes, the next speaker from South Korea is uh, none other than Hyun Jun Lee. She's an assistant professor at the Kyungpuk National University Hospital in Daegu, South Korea, which is actually the epicenter, the first epicenter of uh, South Korea where the outbreak happened. And uh, what better than to have someone from Daegu to share with us the experience at a point in time and how they managed to get themselves out of it and now in phase two of the pandemic. It's a real privilege having you, Young Yu, speaking and giving a lecture of your terrific experience. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment, for your time being here. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In Korea, the cumulative confirmed cases are over uh, than 10,000 now. The first case developed on 19th January for about one month. Newly confirmed cases were limited and the patients had a history of overseas traveling. However, the outbreak of COVID-19 in Korea started on 18th February with the female patient in my city, Daegu. After that, the number of confirmed cases were rising exponentially. The most of COVID-19 patients in Korea was from uh, my city and near area. For your information, we have a 50 million population in South Korea and 2.5 million in Daegu. Our hospital is a tertiary referral, uh, referral hospital and uh, it is in a trauma center of the Daegu Gyeongbu area. <laughs> However, in nearby we have a two uh, more infectious disease control center hospital in Daegu. And our hospital is the control tower of isolation group care center for asymptomatic self quarantining persons. In phase uh, one situation, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, we are now in phase two. So uh, before introducing the phase two uh, situation, I would like to talk the phase one situation. Uh, I will uh, talk the reason later. About 50 days, not urgent elective surgeries have been postponed. The word for elective surgeries of our aesthetic department went towards shutdown for stripping nurses to the isolation ward. All admission was possible only after coming back TCR results. Day surgery unit and outpatient clinics were open even for phase one. However, the patient number of day surgery center and outpatient clinic decreased due to social distancing campaign. The precaution protocol for confirmed or suspected uh, patients uh, is like this. We follow the instruction from uh, our uh, control tower, our control tower. The number of medical personnel facilities should be minimized in the operation theater to avoid the contamination. Negative pressure isolation operating room is used for the suspected patient and ventilation after surgery is mandatory and dis disinfection, of course. Uh, adequate personal equipment and cautious training is uh, the most important. We delimited the route of patients in hospital. For all determined cases, un un undetermined cases with fever who need surgery, uh, we use the same precaution protocol to that of suspected or confirmed cases. If the patient doesn't ex experience symptoms, we use a 
uh, N95 masks and additional uh, waterproof gown. Uh, in this uh, case, this 25-year-old woman patient was referred to our hospital due to the compartmental syndrome in the fingertip bias of palm. She has a mental retardation. So COVID-19 had been already confirmed several days ahead of the transfer to our hospital. To reduce the contamination of a central dental operation theater, we decided to perform decompression with the digital block in the isolation ward. Because we did not know the, how much time the treatment took, we, uh, I and my one resident used the power day of purifying respirator. Full procedure over 30 minutes in the isolation while the power day of purifying respirator is recommended. Fortunately, the finger recovered the circulation. Uh, during the phase one, a few pedestrians and cars were seen near my hospital and table, my city. Okay, let me talk about the phase two. I think Korea uh, is now in phase two for 25 days, uh, uh, about one month from one month ago. We performed the routine surgeries at before outbreaks. Our ward uh, reopened. However, all patients should have negative results in PCR tests before admission. The PCR test provides the results four times per day. Uh, in phase two, five times uh, in phase one. It takes uh, three to four hours the results to come out in uh, my hospital. The day before yesterday, uh, a 48 year old man got injured by a conveyor belt. So uh, the tone breaker artery and compartment syndrome in the form was suspected. So the surgery is mandatory. Before confirmation of the PCR results, the surgery was started. Because the results come out negative during the surgery, I only wore the K-94 masks and an ordinary surgical gown here. And this is the movable uh, negative pressure facility for the surgery room. Um, what COVID-19 gave us is the clear sky. I think it could and ever interwoven always. Uh, this is uh, my uh, results. The yellow bar means routine cases and gray and orange color means emergency cases. The difference is that the orange one is from emergency room directly and the gray one from general world. For about 80 days, total 49 surgeries were performed. The pale color in February means the surgeries before the outbreak. Because there was no restriction on day surgery, the population of local anesthesia was higher to similar, uh, higher or similar to general anesthesia during, during pandemic crisis. Especially in March, we utilized more day surgery center compared to uh, before outbreak. The most patients underwent surgery in time, including COVID-19 confirmed case. However, we had six cases with a technical delay based on the state to serve the patients. The six cases were one pain injury to finger injury by a so without vascular compromise and two finger amputation without had no distal stumps and one finger laceration without tendon injury and uh, one suspicious infection by foreign bodies. The delayed time was less than nine hours for all cases and most of them were from another hospital due to fever, not uh, for their injury. Telemedicine had been strictly prohibited in Korea by our government. Korean Medical Association also had opposed the telemedicine for several reasons. However, due to outbreak in Daegu, telemedicine was allowed for repeated medication only temporarily. Uh, in my calculation, about 10% of our patients used the phone counseling and prescription in our whole hospital, including internal medicine and surgery. Um, several days ago, if you see this graph, uh, in certain area, we still have a rise in COVID. 
However, uh, this is not a community associated infection. And as, a, as Andrew told me uh, a few days ago, several days ago, uh, COVID-19 was confirmed in a man who roamed several club, or nightclub. More than 1,500 uh, 1, people contacted with these patients. So now Korea um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is tracking the route of contact patients. Uh, I'm concerned uh, what if we have a community associated infection again. That's why I uh, mentioned phase one uh, first. Nobody knows the, this curve rising or flattening in Korea. Summary, the surgery and hospitalization were performed uh, by guideline briefly, no admission without PCR results. Adequate equipment should be used during surgery. Local anesthesia or day surgery without hospitalization is preferred. In our outpatient clinic, we changed our precaution equipment to K1994 or surgical masks. Uh, it's different from uh, N95 mask. In addition, we partially use the telemedicine for our patient clinic during pandemic crisis with caution. But um, in, in Korea, the situation is a little bit uh, worse, worsened. So the, the patient whom I mentioned uh, spread the, uh, their contact person to every, everywhere in Korea now. Oh, thank you for your kind attention. Okay. Thank you, Yongbyo. Uh, thank you, uh, Hyunju. Uh, Bo, would you like to introduce our Hong Kong colleagues uh, to the audience? Yes, Alex Choi from Hong Kong will share his uh, experience on this uh, 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 crisis. Thank you very much. In the sky, and now you hardly see any planes in this beautiful, beautiful morning. So, the COVID 19 pandemic is affecting not just the medical system, but affecting our life so much. So, um, maybe just a few words about the background of healthcare system in Hong Kong. So, we are basically uh, like the UK, uh, we manage uh, many of the uh, public sector. But by, by public funding. We are under the hospital authority, which took care of most of the patients as inpatients. And uh, because of this, the central policy in uh, handling epidemic is very important. So we basically follow all the policy laid down by the hospital authority in Hong Kong. So when we not um, talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, without talking about the SARS in 2000, and three in Hong Kong, because this is a very big, big lesson that we have learned in the past. And uh, the graph on the top uh, right hand corner is no familiar, uh, you, you are now not familiar with it, because there is the graph of uh, incidents of all the cases of SARS back in 2003. So it was, we, we learned a very hard lesson at that time, and uh, since that time, uh, we start very much SARS as an even higher case mortality compared to the COVID 19, and it's also a coronavirus infection. So, one lesson we have learned in the past so, uh, it's divided into four aspects. First thing is the general public become more hygienic. As uh, Andrew has said, without the participation of the general public, it's difficult to to, to calm down the epidemic. 
So from the start in 2003, we, we start to know the importance of the antiseptics in public area. Everyone in Hong Kong is well accepting to wearing masks and uh, developing hand washing habits. We all know that we should not go to work or go to school if we got a fever. And a uh, very important thing, which many times we have uh, neglected, is the sewage management maintenance. Because uh, the fecal soiling of the virus is sort of one important route for the transmission. If the aerosol, aerosolization of the fecal and contaminated fecal material, it can also be spread through the sewage. So changing the healthcare system is also important. We also start to have a three level of alert system in Hong Kong from, from the uh, alert, severe and the emergency. And uh, we start to have stock counting of the PPE in Hong Kong for three months stock. Uh, we have uh, developed all the infection ward facilities in all public hospitals in Hong Kong with a total of 1,400 negative pressure infection beds in, in the territory. And uh, we have infection control exercise for all healthcare personnel. We also go deep into research, uh, epidemiology, molecular biology, or the PCR tests, or the genome uh, uh, library for the coronavirus, so that when the epidemic starts, we have all the basic material to develop the PCR tests. And of course, the government preparedness is also very important because without their openness and the responsiveness, it cannot control the epidemic. When we start to sense there's some threat, we know what to do. And uh, I think every, every territory should know how to exercise their authority to quarantine and contact tracing. So this is the chronology of uh, COVID-19 in Hong Kong. So uh, we start uh, fighting against this epidemic very early when we start to hear about uh, some atypical pneumonia of unknown origin in Wuhan. We, we already raised our alert level from uh, alert to, to severe back in January and fall. So we start a compulsory mask wearing in the, in the public hospital and to reduce the visiting hours for for, for people coming to visit uh, their, their patients in the public hospital. And in January 8th, we already accepted the unknown disease at that time, severe respiratory disease associated with a local infectious agent. We don't have a name at that time, we already accepted that to a notifiable infectious disease so as to uh, make the quarantine order uh, become a legal order. And uh, the, other, the other thing about the chronology in Hong Kong, I think it's already reported well in the, some uh, literature, like the Canadian Journal and the New England Journal of Medicine, which have goes to the, to the uh, literature and search about the, the researchers in Hong Kong about all this. So we actually start the fight against this epidemic very early on. But it's not uh, until March when we have the second wave, as you can see in the graph, uh, the second wave in March, then we pick up a lot of cases. But again, with all the measures that we have, we still able to control the epidemic. So the summary of uh, what uh, Hong Kong uh, measures against the COVID-19, I summarize here, uh, we have a universal voluntary mask for everyone. Everyone well accepted to wear a mask. So actually you heard about the news that people in Hong Kong actually uh, really pay a lot of price and then uh, high price and then and uh, the market for the all the mask. And then we have early school closure. Up till now, we still haven't opened the school yet. Well, we don't have any formal lockdown, and we have compulsory social distancing during the second wave. And we do all uh, viral testing for fever case, for pneumonia case with positive traveling history, and to all those who have close contact with all the positive cases. And all infection cases are kept in hospital in isolation ward. They are only released until they are clear of infection by the definition of at least two specimen negative for the SARS-CoV-2. Now all the close contact persons are quarantined at least for 14 days and all other contacts are kept under self-medical surveillance. And with all this measure, 
we succeed in a way that we still have not reached the number of patients COVID-19 in Hong Kong compared to the SARS in 2003. And we have so far, we have only four mortality compared with two, nearly 300 mortality uh, 17 years ago. If the ID healthcare worker have to sacrifice. So up to this point, uh, I shall hand over to Margaret Fox, Dr. Margaret Fox, to continue her presentation about the measures in hospital about hand, hand surgery patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for your wonderful sharing. So our next speaker will be uh, Margaret Falk from uh, Hong Kong University. Thank you, Alex. It was a really comprehensive lecture and very uh, accurate. Thanks. Okay. Hi everyone. So I'm just going to talk about um, a little bit about the, how we manage the hand surgery patients in Hong Kong. So, um, yes. so um, as Alex was talking about that, um, Hong Kong has been very lucky because we have done um, intensive surveillance right from the start, right from late January, um, when we heard about um, what happened in China. And because Hong Kong do have a lot of people um, traveling back and forth from China, so we um, and because of what happens. In, um, in SARS, in 2003 about SARS, we really worry about this. So the governments have done intensive surveillance very early on. And so looking at the graph, you can see that um, Hong Kong has been um, very low in the graph. So very early on, uh, we do have, um, we have canceled um, all elective hand surgeries since um, January 2020, late 2020. So basically it's after the Chinese New Year, we have canceled all of them. The trauma, um, we still continue with the trauma surgeries and all the other emergencies, um, but basically the emergency list is shared by the entire hospital. So we still have, um, we still need to manage um, finger fractures and wrist fractures, tendon cut infections and meninges. And the reason why we do that is to first is to conserve the PVE um, because we want to make sure that we have PVE for if there is a surge of the community outbreak. And second is also to um, to have encouraged social distancing. We don't want the patients to come in, that, like um, healthy patients coming in and get infected in the hospital. So, um, so for the for surgeries, uh, we divided them into either cases where they are confirmed COVID cases or suspected or highly suspected and COVID cases. So we don't really have a complete semi-isolation theater, but we have um, we have um, we have a theater where it is modified so that it will still have um, um, an, a, a positive pressure because we don't want because in some way we we want a positive pressure inside the theater to make it clean and we don't want to bring infection from outside. Um, and I'll show it to you later how, how it runs. So um, we, and then we have designated route for patient's transportation. We minimize um, as much OT personnel as much as possible. And all personnel, if they are confirmed cases, they'll be fully gone up and ready to receive the patients before the patients coming in. And the reason why I um, said that there should, we don't actually give shoe cover, we actually change shoes. And the reason is um, our microbiologists actually have have done survey and have done and have um, have ordered all the cases. And actually, they think that if we actually have shoe cover, we actually have increased our chance of having contamination because we have to bend down to actually remove the cover. And so actually, um, it's better to have to have new specific shoes, designated shoes for those cases, and then we'll clean afterwards. So this is a workflow for the semi-isolation um, theater. Basically, the, the red one is where the, where the theater where we're going to have the cases. The blue one is, com is another theater, which is completely clean, and we have, we have all the doors um, being locked down and sealed down. So in the red room, um, there will be still be positive pressure coming from the ceiling, and then um, the air will go 
um, will be will be dispersed out into the field, into the corridor. So the corridor is what we call um, a contaminated area. And then, but then it will, but all the doors will be all sealed up from outside. So that's why when the patients come in, so we have all the staff ready and we receive the patients. When the patients get received in, then all the doors will get all sealed up. And so this is the area where it is now contaminated. And all the patients, and, and then we are all gowned up and then we'll do this, the, the surgery. After that, then all the personnel will go through this, um, will go through the, the corridor and then, and all into the clean area where they gown. And we have everybody to, um, we are very worried about gowning because um, again, our microbiologists have done studies during the SARS and think that people actually don't get infected when they are wearing, um, when they are fully geared. But it is, but the most high risk area time that they get infected, healthcare workers get infected, is during the degang because they didn't pay enough attention. So we make sure that everybody gets spot by the other people to make sure that they have a proper degang. And then we'll have another door that leaves um, to the, um, another clean door that leaves out and then go up to another theater and then um, um, after the degang. So for the low risk patients, which means that we screen that when they have no contact history or a pre-respiratory tract infection, fever or trouble history, um, we still use our normal positive pressure theaters. Um, for interpatient, um, the anesthetist will be fully gowned up. And once they are intubated, then it is a closed system. So for us as surgeons, we just need um, we just need masks and goggles. For regional blocks, um, again, the patient we just only need them to have masks on, and I will tell you why later. Um, but yeah, and then and the surgeons is still just surgical masks plus or minus goggles. So for the outpatient clinic, um, we cancelled all our long-term routine follow-up cases or the chronic cases, and we space out our patients' appointments time slots. Um, we also space out patients in the waiting room. Um, waiting for the doctors, and we minimize any accompanied persons. I mean, some of the times that some of the old people they need the, the elderly, they need they need accompanied persons. So we allow them, but then we ask them to minimize to one if possible. We all wear masks, and and one of the things that we touch our patients, and then we make sure that we have encouraged them to have hand hygiene. We have temporary check, and then we have trouble history, and if they have trouble history within 14 days. Not a patient planning at all. Um, and then for the hand therapy sessions for allow health, we also decrease the number of, um, of visits and we encourage them to have home program. So, so for the wards, we actually change what well our orthopedic wards to negative pressure wards just in case that we have a surge and then we need to use it um, for, for, for to, to accept COVID cases. For the nurses and surgeons, all of them have to have N95 fit tests. They have to have infection control training. Um, as mentioned, we have to have gang up and gang down training, and that was because we think that that's the most important thing, um, and so that we won't get infected. And so in that case, we are actually very lucky in Hong Kong. None of the none of the allied health people or and any of the healthcare workers have got infected because of working in the hospital. Um, we do have voluntary deployment and we do it and it continues for at least two weeks. Um, that is so that we don't have on and off and then we don't want to contend with other people. And I've then because of that, I've done two weeks um, of voluntary deployment into the civilian squad. We also encourage people to take annual leaves at a time because we we, suspect, we know that when they come, because when we know that um, we have cancer most of the elective list and later on when they are, when, when, when all the cases come back, um, then we will be very busy. So we encourage the, the, the ones to take annual leaves at the same time and we discourage overseas trouble. So this is a um, diagram that shows why we're talking about that we have that we um, only patients, if they just have an LA case as a regional block, why uh, mass will do is because even if they are suspected, if this is the patient's, um, actually this is the patient's um, room, uh, um, isolation room, and we know that if a patient were, it's a negative pressure room, we know that if a patient were wearing masks, actually you don't actually get any, um, uh, you don't, you, in, the, in the air, you don't actually, um, get any virus. 
um, from the air sampling. It's only if if they don't have any mass, this is still the most area that they will have the they will have a widely positive of 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 of, of, of virus. And all the yellow part is all the yellow spots is very mild, and most of these are basically the the, the surfaces. And so we need to clean that. Um, we need to clean it um, carefully after it. And the blue ones are completely, they, they're all negative for something. So that's why we think that um, actually, mass, so we, we know that the mass um, will, will, be, will be good enough if, even if the case is with a, with a COVID-19 um, COVID positive, that um, if it's on the regional block, then that should be done. This is a recommended PPE in different settings. So we, um, for the, obviously, for the ones that in the, if they have uh, aerosol um, procedures, generating procedures like GA and all that, then we have full gear, which includes an N95 and the face shield and then and the gown and disposable gloves. So we also have enhanced um, measures, um, both external to the public as well as internal within our uh, our, our hospital or basically within the hospital authority. So we have daily press conference to 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 um, tell the public what's been happening and then just to and another way to encourage them to to continue the social distancing and wearing masks. And internal we have regular Zoom meeting and staff forum. We also have some regular COVID-19 bulletin which includes what has been happening and then includes all our PPE stock tips just to make sure that everybody is aware of what's happening. Um, we also have um, um, an apps, which is the Ottawa Authority apps, which tells us um, any news that has been, and also we have staff early sickness alert system. So if you are a little sick, then we want to be alert to the, to the system very early on, and we encourage you to be quarantined um, until, you are, until you get better, or then or you may need to have a test. So for phase two, so we are sort of now into starting into phase two, and that is because that we um, all our cases that um, is all imported case, which is diagnosed during the quarantine or on on or on arrival. So actually, we don't have any local infected cases for over two weeks. Um, so there's no community outbreak for the past two weeks. And we also have decreased infected hospital cases, so most people are, are actually um, are recovering and then are discharged. And we also now have acceptable stock of PPE. We still don't have three months, but then we have two months. And so we thought that we will start opening some of the, the elective surgeries. So this is not completely from zero to all. So we have a gradual increase in number of surgeries, and that depends on, on different hospitals. And we still have to, so for hand surgeries, we still have to prioritize them. So, for example, there will be cases, for example, um, um, uh, a, a severe ulnar palsy, then they may need to, to do first. Um, we also need to think about the patients and the comorbidity. Maybe that it is not the best idea to ask them with, co, um, with a lot of comorbidity to come in at the time. So, um, we was, um, so we try to have patients who come in for for younger age and then also it doesn't actually need to stay in the hospital for a long time and at the moment we still don't have any visitors allowed any visitors coming in for screening patients um we don't unfortunately we don't I mean, we only do contact history and travel history and ulti and fever and and we do chest x-ray except for la cases currently we don't actually do any routine rapid covid um, tests for all patients come in and i think part of the reason is that because we don't um we don't have that we, we don't have that community outbreak at the moment so thankfully so that's why um at the moment we have no routine rapid covid tests for elective cases but um, as similar to what um, in, in in Korea, um, if we if we do we, we do have a four to we have a four times um, 20, over twenty four hours run of tests, so that can be so any tests can become uh, results can come in within four hours. GA cases um, again, so we still use our positive pressure theatre because that will minimise the the. the general um, bacteria infection, we, um, unless there's a suspect cases where they will go up to the other specialized theater. Intubation, they still fully gang up and they have a specialized gang area. Um, surgeons, 
um, we don't have we have face masks and and and, and we use face shield. There's no difference if we use power drill or not because there are studies that show that actually the power drill and the bones um, that, that comes out as actually doesn't contain the virus and so there's no need to actually be really worried about it. So um, so so there's no difference. So we still wear face masks. We don't actually wear N95 um, for anyone and uh, for, 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 all, for all patients. For LA cases, um, as with before, we still just use um, our original block of warrant, we just surgical mask for the patient and everybody else in the theatre we wear surgical masks, plus or minus goggles. In, in between cases, we do clean rooms and that's a universal precaution, so we do clean our rooms and thoroughly. Um, our patient clinic, again, we still space out the patient's appointment slots, we, but we don't cancel them and we space out the patients in the waiting room. And, and we are resuming seeing um, chronic cases. So, but all patients still have to wear masks and we have temperature check and travel history. Again, they, they still, they, they're still not allowed to come if they, if they have travel history of within 14 days. And we resume our, our hand therapy session. So um, we do, one of the things that we really want to make sure is that besides masks is to practice hand hygiene because after touching patients, that is the way that to make sure we encourage all our personnel to, to practice good hand hygiene because um, that is the way to protect ourselves. Medications why steroid injections, um, we actually do give them um, for any trigger finger or for any um, muscular pain, we do give them and we haven't stopped any. And, and, and Again, we haven't stopped, and and we and and as you said, we are actually very lucky because we don't have much community outbreak at the moment, and therefore maybe that's the reason why we um we were we were we were a bit um we are a bit hesitant of not to give any um any any of these steel objections because in a way we do have a long waiting list um, for most of our cases um for two joint is a few years waiting list, and so actually it would be really bad if we can't give any injections or NSID for our patients. Um, so in, in preparation for another outbreak, I think um, we do, we, so now we are preparing for availability for rapid cover tests for all our patients if needed, if there's another outbreak coming on. Um, we already have our isolation theatres and acid pressure wards. We will try to have a better isolation theatres. For negative pressure wards, um, we have changed it back to positive now, but um, we know that there's a specific way that we can change it back very quickly. Our PPE stock will try to get um, to keep on having our, to make sure our PPE stock is available and, and that they are they we do have a, a good stock. And and if there's another outbreak, we just need to tighten again to control of the patients and personal flow and personnel flow and um, and again it's mainly public education, contact tracing, quarantine and isolation. So and hope that the second, if there is another outbreak, it will be better than the first one because this time we're much more prepared and so we should be able to do it much um, better than our first time, than, than the first time phase one. So um, I think Alex is going to show us um, one of the cases that he had. Um, that is yeah, one of the, just to come and share us with the cases. Just before we end with this. Okay, excellent, Margaret, excellent. Excellent presentation, it was really... Yes. Impressed. Alex, 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 sorry, Alex, can you please start again? Because yes. we've lost uh, the first part because your microphone was Thank muted. You. Can you start again, sorry. please? So sorry. Thanks. That's all right. So sorry. 
it, it, just a case illustration uh, about a lady who is a, who is a case of uh, COVID-19, but when we do the operation, did the operation, we didn't know that. Uh, so uh, she's the 63rd case of COVID-19 in Hong Kong. She's asymptomatic at that time with no fever, no travel history, chest is very clear. Uh, the surgeons just wore standard sterile attire, uh, normal ASTM level three mask, not an N95, but with eye shields. She underwent spinal asphyxia. We used unipolar diaphragmy. We used power saw for the femoral lab preparation, but we stayed away from post lavage before the cementation. Uh, with just these standard uh, pep, uh, uh, measures, we didn't have any infection, despite we don't know that it is the case. We have a total around 40 something close contact uh, with that patient. One of them developed COVID 19 after the surgery and after the, after the uh, patient was discharged. So it, it showed that although COVID 19 is a uh, is a highly infectious case, but with sometimes with uh, some standard uh, surgical measures, standard mask, standard gowns, we can still stay away from getting infected. So much so that in Hong Kong, I mean, uh, up till now, up to this moment, we do not think that using high speed device like drilling, sawing, etc., will uh, have significant aerosolization of the bone or body fluid that may cause COVID-19 to the healthcare workers. So we do not recommend to wear N95 respirator during surgery involving high-speed devices. And we don't screen all the cases for SARS-CoV number two before surgery. Just a, a word of warning, if you are not using surgical N95 respirators, then you need the face shield because these non-surgical N95 are not waterproof. They are not uh, good enough to prevent contamination by body fluid or blood when they spray towards you. So these are my supplementation to Margaret's presentation. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Alex. I'm I'm really sure it's going to raise a lot of questions yes. in the, yes. for sure, uh, yes. in the discussion. So I would like to ask Laura Martini if she can start to call, uh, to report on the, the question she collected on the, on the chats, Laura. First. Uh, can you listen to me? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, regarding the first presentation from Bolu, uh, the most frequent questions are regarding how long uh, it takes for the screening process, uh, for example, uh, swab or others. And uh, the first question uh, for this argument is uh, from uh, Pierluigi Tors. And, uh, Would you let Bo yes. reply the question? Bo, can you please? Uh, yes. Yes, I think the, the uh, quick screening, screening uh, timing for screening actually is different from hospital to hospital. But roughly, uh, in China, most of hospital actually have, could have got the result uh, with, within 12, 12 hours, mm -hmm. and some hospital actually has uh, even quicker, just uh, a few hours. So it all depends. I, I think it's the same, same thing happening in the rest of the world. You could differ, a uh, hospital actually has different uh, protocol and different uh, timing. So, to... Okay. Uh, thanks. The, the following question was? The following question was? Following well, questions, uh, so uh, uh, if PCR, can be useful, more useful for emergency cases, uh, and uh, how uh, he manage for the for the test in the emergency cases. Mm. 
Bo, do you have an answer there? Have you? Uh, I'm not the expert on this. Uh, I, I'm not sure if any 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 uh, anyone can answer this question because I'm not expert on this. Really, uh, not. Uh... Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I saw that there were plenty of questions to um, uh, Margaret uh, Yunju. Can... And Andrea, sorry, we have yeah. also uh, one question from the presentation of, from Andrew. Okay. Before, uh, from Eugenio Brito. And uh, Eugenio Brito uh, asked, uh, Circuit Breaker, the first or the second slide, uh, measures uh, is composed of uh, what actions? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, circuit breaker is actually like what we call the enhanced partial lockdown. Uh, essentially, the, we enforce social distancing uh, among the general population and everybody is supposed to wear a mask. Uh, there are penalties if you don't follow these uh, strict uh, expectations. Uh, there are people who are fine and some of them have even gone to jail. <laughs> so uh, these are what we call the circuit breaker measures and of course uh, for hospital it means tightening up of uh, uh, and, uh, of the infection control as well as the segregation of uh, uh, the, the different uh, types of patients those who are uh, exposed and those who are confirmed cases uh, versus the general non-COVID uh, uh, cases as well yeah Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Laura, any other question or we can ask Andrew, Andrea Marchesini if he's ready with other Hi. questions? Yeah. Yes, I'm ready. And the main uh, question is for Margaret and uh, Ara regarding the reference for uh, the sentence that you that she posed uh, in her, in, during her talk regarding the risk of uh, Virus spread during the uh, bone draining. Yes, um, unfortunately, I don't actually have the references on hand because um, there was something that actually I read that, that we were um, being circulated within our community, um, our hospital authority, which issues that they actually have reviewing relevant international studies and have seek local experts' opinions, and they said. There's no direct evidence that high-speed devices for surgery is generating aerosols um, that spread COVID-19. And they said the viral load in blood in general is very low because so that's why we, we get the viral load from the saliva. So in the, in the blood itself, it's very low and it's much lower in bone. So that's why they said the risk of spreading COVID-19 if you're drilling the bone is actually very low in surgeries involving high-speed device. And so they said that we don't have to meet um, N95 and we do have and of course we do expect you to have face shield and 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 and, uh, and a mask mm -hmm. and, a, and a face mask during surgeries so basically you do have all the protective things and you just make sure that and if you worry you have to make sure that when you degown you have to do, do a proper degowning and so that you're not touching um yourself in the in um in in a um, you need to do a property guard to make sure that you don't contaminate yourself with with the with the with all your with all your gums and your face shield. Okay, yeah. Alex, would you add anything to um, on this topic? Uh, yes, uh, as uh, said by Margaret, uh, we believe the it's not really a significant aerosolization, but uh, uh, the particles. The death shacks during drilling, sawing, etc., is actually quite big, but they may travel at high speed. So we believe that the face shield, the eye shield, is much more important than an N95 respirator to prevent the surgeon from getting infected. People. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, please. Can I ask a question? From me too? Can I ask a question? Yeah, other questions, please. Uh, yes, uh, uh, this is to my friend uh, Bolio. 
I'm interested to know uh, this uh, lung CT scan as a prerequisite for uh, elective procedure. Um, has it been shown that, that this is actually uh, a, a very, uh, very effective? Because uh, I don't think it's practiced uh, around the rest of the world, but uh, your, your country has adopted this and uh, has gone very much into this uh, CT as a, uh, as a pre pre op meeting. Uh, can you tell us how how did how did they come about this, and then uh, and uh, how how did this uh, uh, how did this uh, I would say uh, this method actually helps to uh, improve uh, the uh, the pre preoperative screening. Thanks, Andrew. So uh, yes, uh, actually uh, this is ex experience from uh, Wuhan CT uh, at the right beginning because. Uh, every while we were waiting for the uh, results of the results of the third swab. It, at the very beginning, it takes uh, it takes more than one day sometimes, and gradually, uh, as more and more patients come, uh, the uh, the doctors actually cannot get the early uh, some uh, early uh, early impression on the patient, and uh, and the doctors in Wuhan actually they find that the. Uh, CT, primary uh, CT actually is uh, also a very good indicator for 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 the suspect patient. Yes, Something wrong with Bo? Oh, soft line. Soft line. Okay. Uh, probably. We, lost, we lost both uh, signal. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are there uh, any uh, other questions? Okay. It's not really from uh, YouTube. Anyone? Uh, from YouTube? No. The on chat, Jit no. Meet was asking if do you do um, make any special. Um, a care when you remove plasters and uh, because you, you also plaster re, um, removal requires a lot of um, uh, a lot of um, uh, say um, uh, dust around do you use any mask or uh, uh, to protect this margaret or uh, yunju we, well, we don't because, well, basically it is outside, it's outside the skin. So basically we just ask the patient to wear a mask to make sure that he's, she's not. Uh, so the, the plus, the, the one who actually saw to do the um, plaster, so basically we wear a mask and the patients will wear a mask. And you are basically just, you're not supposed to get any any cut or any touch, even the, the outside of the skin of the patient. So you're not supposed to injure the patient. So in a way, it's only the plaster dust, which shouldn't really make much of a, which cause much of the, the aerosols as opposed to getting infected. So yeah, yeah we, we don't. Yeah. yeah. Agree. Agree. So uh, before you, you uh, we stop this discussion, would uh, Francesco Venneri ask any, make any comment? Francesco Veneri is a risk uh, manager in uh, in Florence. Yes. Uh, good evening to everyone, uh, and thank thank you, for surgeon. I'm only a general emergency surgeon, and I'm risk manager of the uh, healthcare service trust here in uh, Florence, Italy. I'm very amazed of all your presentations and what you have been doing, and I would like to extend my compliments to Singapore and Korea and all for what have they been doing during this pandemic uh, COVID-19 experience. Well, as a risk manager, uh, what I saw is the very careful attention to PPEs and to the way the operating room layouts should be, uh, should be designed. We're not actually going to phase two, I mean, as I said before, I believe that we're in phase 1B because I, I, I'd like to see what the epidemiology uh, ratios will be within a few weeks 
at least here in Italy. Uh, and so um, I think that it's very important to begin or to re-begin our uh, surgical uh, activities that all uh, operating theaters, that all surgeons, let me say, should sit around a table and uh, try to simulate the pathways that should be designed in order to understand how to manage COVID, non-COVID patients, because we're not going to get free from COVID patients or at least positive COVID-19 patients in the future. We have to be able and we have to be assured that we're going to have to deal with this issue for many, many uh, weeks, months ahead. And so we have to prepare ourselves. I think that we have to understand pathways should be very clear, dirty and non-dirty pathways, but also the way we regulate the flows of patients and also personnel into our hospitals. Uh, of course, I know that, and I'm aware that in this webinar, I don't have much time to express some certain uh, points, but uh, I appreciate it that you all that you all uh, underline the uh, PPE availability stockings and how you address the patients. But I would like uh, if anyone would ask me clinical risk management questions, so that maybe I will be able to uh, give you uh, give you some. Uh, some explanations and some answers. That was my impression. Okay, thank you. I think we can move on. And I would like to ask So to stop sharing her screen, please. Andrew, can you introduce the next speaker, please? Introduce uh, Chai Yu Eng from uh, Wrightington Hospital. Chai Yu Eng is uh, a very good friend of ours. He's actually a Malaysian to begin with, but he has uh, decided to 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 uh, take on uh, his uh, practice in UK, and and uh, he's a very effective advocate for his hospital in terms of this uh, managing uh, how to manage the COVID uh, nineteen uh, patients in his hospital and trucks. So I would like to introduce uh, Chayu uh, to this um, to this uh, webinar, giving the UK's experience and uh, pers uh, perspective uh, to you, Chayu. Good afternoon, um, from Manchester. Thanks, Andrew, for the kind in, uh, introduction. And I'd like to thank Andrea and the Italian Health Society for your kind invitation. It is a real honor to be part of this panel. Um, I, have, I think it's fair to say that I cannot speak for the whole of the UK, but I can share some personal experience as a hand surgeon working in the tertiary unit in the UK. And I try not to cover too much ground that has been covered already, and I hope what I'm giving here is more of a personal perspective as a hand surgeon and share a few tips that I hope may be of use uh, to your daily practice. Well, as you know, in the UK, we are still very much in the middle of the storm. Now, the peak may be over, but we are far from being over from uh, in this uh, outbreak. Everyone is rightly concerned about the second wave. Um, at this moment, it's fair to say that no elective hand surgery is being performed in our department or in the rest of the UK. And what the previous speakers have shared with us will be incredibly useful to me and, uh, the, and my colleagues in the coming weeks. Due to the limitation of time, I shall just touch on four challenges that I face uh, uh, on, in my daily practice. Namely, how to establish the best practice for my patients and how to deal with increasing domestic hand surgery injuries the safety concerns of steroids, and lastly, how we have reconfigured our hand trauma service. One unique feature about healthcare system in the UK, as you know, is National Health Service. It allows a unified countrywide response to the pandemic. As a hand surgeon, my practice is governed by and influenced by government directives, professional guidelines, and local protocols. Because of the sheer size of the organization, sometimes uh, because of the change of the command involved, the response may not be as quick as we would like on the ground level. But nonetheless, we have a unified uh, response. And every professional organization has also published 
pages and pages of documents and guidelines, some more useful than others, and not surprisingly, sometimes they can be contradictory to each other. So at the end, as a hand surgeon, one has to exercise clinical judgment for the patient in front of you. While we are preparing for the next phase, which still seems so far away, we have been asked to review all the patients in our, on our waiting list and to try to stratify the urgency of each case. And then we'll put together to see how we can put them in the order of clinical priority. When people stay at home, they want to do things, they want to fix things. As the weather gets better in the UK, there are now more gardening injuries. Now, the, as the National Health Society, uh, our Health Society, has put efforts on educating the public regarding the importance of hand injuries prevention using various show, social media platforms. And I believe uh, our, hands, our, our various Health Society uh, would also have the similar responsibility on public education and prevention. The British Hand Society also maintains a hand injury triage app in order to assist both the specialists and non-specialists in the initial management of hand injuries. It is freely available and you can find the app on the link. Now, one of the challenges we faced right at the beginning of the outbreak was the safety of steroid injection. Extrapolating experience from influenza, MERS and SARS there were concerns that steroids may be associated with adverse outcome. The immunological impact of steroid injection in patients with COVID-19 remains unknown. We can argue and question the quality of evidence. In any case, they are now concerned that steroids could increase risk from COVID-19. It could increase risk of an adverse outcome. We could also be injecting patients who are incubating COVID-19. So, the Royal College of Anesthetists, British Society for Rheumatology and NHS quickly published guidelines. The message is the same in that we should exercise clinical judgment and perform case-by-case -case risk benefit assessment. In practice, in our department and many of my colleagues across the country have effectively stopped all routine steroid injections. Now, even when the lockdown is relaxed and elective surgery is resumed, I imagine the anxiety will linger on. And so now uh, our colleagues are in discussion about searching for alternatives to injection therapy in various hand conditions. For instance, in trigger finger, uh, I would normally offer a trial of steroid injection as a first line. Now, after this outbreak, a personal change on my practice may be to offer them percutaneous release as the primary treatment practically bypassing the steroid injection step. And I'm happy doing this particularly for the middle and ring fingers. Now, strategy for other common hand conditions will need to be discussed and formulated. Locally at Wrightington, we have reconfigured our hand trauma provision. Essentially, we have taken over the minor injury units from the accident emergency. Patients with hand trauma will be triaged directly to our hot clinic uh, the whole clinic is staffed with a consultant, physiotherapist, and plus a technician. We also have a mini CM for manipulation. The aim is to provide all treatment necessary in a single stop, single visit if possible. For those who require surgery, it will be planned for a separate clean site uh, after screening. The nature of our service here, we have two different main sites which allow us to have this arrangement. Now, in the other team, enough has been said about having key members as well, and it is the same practice. We will use absorbable switches, we leave the KYS prop, and we also provide dressing packs to patients. For those who subsequently require a full cast, we will use a soft cast, which can be removed easily by patient. All follow-up, including therapy, will be done virtually as much as possible. Now, as part of surgery, we will try to do most surgery uh, in the upper limb under regional or local anesthesia. And I've been a practitioner of Wallands for many years. During this COVID pandemic, what is important to stress that actually Wallands is missing two letters. It's probably known as, better known as Nawalan. Why? No anesthetist, wide awake local anesthesia, no 20K. 
do not get me wrong, I have huge respect for my anesthetist colleague. And during this time, they have far pressing uh, duty and they are the most valuable uh, member of staff to look after the critically ill patients. So anything that we can do to free them up, I think will be a good thing. Now on the technical tip on um, Walan, uh, the I have encountered certainly in my training is the difficulty of calculating the maximum safe dose for local anesthesia. Now this is the formula, and you all know the uh, uh, the safety dose in milligram per kg and so and so forth. But there is actually an even simpler way. I'll just give you the uh, multiple. So. If you are using xylocaine or lidocaine with adrenaline, if you multiply the person's or the patient's weight with a factor of 0 0.7, you give the safe maximum dose, which is 49 mils. And each bottle typically comes in 20 mils. So you can quite safely use two bottles. Now, if volume is what you require, you can also mix it up with bupivacaine. For a 0.5% bupivacaine with adrenaline, if you use the multiple of 0 0.4 against the body weight, you get the maximum dose, which is 28. If you need more volume, you can use 0 0.25 bupivacaine, in which case you use the multiple of 0 0.8. So there you go. You just have to remember 0 0.7 and 0 0.4. And the keys, some of the keys to success of uh, doing Wallan surgery includes time, patience, but also volume. Now, lastly, I would like to end with a cautionary tale. A young lady presented to our department, to our whole clinic, with a superficial cut on the, uh, on the forearm. At exploration, the injury was rather superficial, and she required only wound closure. However, something else lied more deeply. Following further inquiry, there was, in fact, history of deliberate self-harm and domestic abuse. She was subsequently referred to the appropriate mental health and social services. I want to use this as a reminder that prolonged social isolation may increase self-harm behavior and self-harm may be, in fact be a cry for help from, from someone under distress. Such patients may present to us uh, hand surgeons. So apart from treating the apparent injury, we can also play a part in identifying other underlying issues and initiating onward referral. In conclusion, as doctors, first do no harm has always been our guiding principle. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought the consideration of protecting the healthcare staff to the fore. As we progress to the next phase, we will have to grapple with limited resources and competing priorities while providing care for our hand surgery patients. Dear friends and colleagues, I aim for the calm sea after the storm is over and when we meet in person again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chai Yu. Excellent presentation, very nice. And you also properly open up to the different aspects of this pandemic, which is not only, uh, not only surgery. Um, uh, I don't have in upwards to to thank the, the colleagues from the Asian area and uh, you Chai Yu for your very clear lectures and I would like to ask if are there any questions like Ricardo has some questions to yes yes there is some question from the chat and also from me um, compliment for your presentation is excellent it's very uh, addressed to the end surgeons, very specific. Thank you. Uh, one question is that um, you said that uh, the cortisone should not be used for uh, introduction um, by into the into the tendon or close to the tendon. Uh, but what about the patient that uh, just uses the cortisone for uh, general pathology like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or, or uh, polymyalgia or several other things. Uh, they are affected from the COVID-19 or not? And there is a different question about this. Can you answer to that? Yes, uh, Ricardo, thanks for the question. And this is a question that actually as a group, uh, we have to examine the quality of the evidence 
the evidence, as I understand, was actually from um, previous epidemics and by observing the use of systemic corticosteroids and they look at uh, viral clearance, mortality, adverse outcome, and it, it is an extrapolation. So rightly, as doctors, we are risk averse in case there is that small risk, we are so afraid to use, and then all the various societies have published guidelines. And you can imagine, as a practicing surgeon, the safe thing is to stop it. So in practice, we have, we have stopped it. So now is the time that we have to really examine to see whether it's necessary to stop all of it, such as uh, for uh, flexor injection, for, for joint injection. And in fact, there are exceptions to all that, like the, the, the patient or rheumatology patient who are maintained on steroid injection, it would not be fair to stop that because they're going to have a flare of disease. So I have highlighted the issue. I do not have the answer, but I hope uh, we as a group can start looking at solutions. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Shayu. There is a question from Margaret Fock to you, the last question. What do you wear uh, during your wellness procedure? Do you, um, do you uh, put any special mask or shields? A position too. In theory, the wellness procedure is fairly low risk or certainly if you're just doing soft tissue, it's not aerosol generating procedure. However, I have, I have to say, I have to give credit to my hospital where we have adequate supply of PPE. We are mindful of the limited stock overall. So at the moment for all surgery, we will still uh, use uh, FFP3 uh, is the UK standard or, or M95 elsewhere and then with a goggle. So we have that as a universal rule for any surgery at this moment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And then I, now I would like to invite Mireya Espluga to introduce the, the, the Spanish friends that very kindly accepted to share their experience. Thank you, Mireya. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, all of you, for being there. Uh, in Spain, we are still in phase zero, and uh, the big cities are in phase zero. And now I wanted to introduce you four friends of mine who work in big hospitals of three big cities in Spain, which are in phase zero, and, and to, to share with you the, their experience and what we expect to organize for phase one. So first of all, I introduce to Pedro Delgado. Pedro Delgado is the Chief of Osteopathic Surgery Department and Hand Unit at a private hospital in Madrid. The second one will be Vicente Caratala. Vicente is a hand and upper limb surgeon in a private hospital in Valencia. The third one will be Alex Luke. Alex is the Chief of the Hand and Wrist Unit at the Public Hospital of Vallebron University Hospital in Barcelona, and one of my partners in the Kaplan Hand Institute in Barcelona. And the fourth one would be Fernando Corella, which is a, hand, a consultant hand surgeon who works in two university hospitals in Madrid. One of them was a collapsed hospital during this COVID pandemic. So nothing to add. Um, I will share your questions to them, so be, be free to ask them as much questions you want. Thank you. Pedro, go ahead. Adelante, Pedro, si puedes. Thank you, Mireya. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrew. Oh, of course, uh, all of the uh, Italian Society of Hand Surgery for Capitation for stay here in this uh, very important uh, webinar. Um, as you know, I work in, uh, in Madrid in, in a private uh, hospital, and we, we are, I am going to present our experience with the, with the COVID-19. Um, as you know, 
Probably in Spain, the first case was noticed in, at the end of February, okay? And uh, Spain is the second country in the world with uh, total declarated cases. And uh, the, the, the fourth uh, country in the world with deaths about uh, COVID. And uh, the, the third one about recoveries. It's the only good news in this uh, pandemic uh, situation. About our country, especially in Madrid and Catalonia, we have a serious problems with this uh, pandemic, actually. And this is uh, some picture of Madrid. I don't know if somebody of you has stayed there, but usually it is not the normal aspect. Uh, as you know, this is the, the hashtag Quédate en Casa, is uh, stay at home. And this crisis uh, uh, originated a lot of problems with uh, social population and, of course, with economic uh, problems also. Uh, my hospital uh, stay in, in Madrid, very close to Madrid, uh, in the western of Madrid. And this is my hospital, it's a level one hospital, it's a private only practice hospital. It's a university center uh, with a Hansel unit uh, reference in Spain and also is, is a, a Hansel committee accreditation center. Uh, in Madrid, in this occasion, there are no private or public hospitals. All hospitals are for all the people. And our hospital, our group, uh, is the, se the sixth uh, hospital in Madrid treating uh, COVID patients. With uh, a total of uh, 23,000 patients uh, attended and treated in our in in hospital and our institution. Uh, what about logistic? Uh, we, we participate in, in this paper, uh, directed by Filidio Erno from the Sarkour, with uh, the experience of the initial experience with this, the pandemic area. And the recommendation was uh, treat non urgent and energy study postponed, um, uh, identify the COVID 19 uh, patients, uh, cancel in person consultation and replace by video, and teleconsultation and meetings and session by video conference only. Uh, in our staff, we, we prepare an active staff reduction. Only 20% of, uh, of the people, the staff, uh, work uh, in this period uh, without external collaborators, collaborators, collaborators or consultants. Uh, we create a crisis staff with only six orthopedic surgeons without residents and fellows. About the uh, emergency hand surgery was covered by only two members of the unit for all, all, the, all the situations. Um, of course, uh, we collaborate with uh, all uh, staff of the hospital, uh, and we train it in diagnosis and management of these uh, COVID patients. And the, 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 the rest of the, of the, of the staff uh, stay at home and um, working about the, the pandemic, and also prepare uh, some release uh, research uh, collaboration. Uh, we pre prepare some change in our activity, especially in the office, because we reduced to the to uh, fifteen percent of activity, only for non deliverable and post-operative consultation, and we create daily and video consultation. Uh, for us, it's very important because, uh, uh, as I told you, uh, uh, we are in a private hospital, and. Uh, we don't know if the insurance companies we economically support this type of activity. It's a great uh, job in, in, in this moment. Uh, about social media or our department, uh, prepare some presentations, uh, express the, the message stay at home in this uh, uh, time. And about the procedures allowed in this uh, period, about emergencies, we have uh, only one sergeant in the emergency room for uh, 12 hours of the day uh, and transfer this uh, department to a cleaning area not in the rest of, with the rest of uh, emergencies with uh, uh, only in a, a separate area uh, than the, the COVID area. Of course, hand emergency surgery is still open as normal and we try to prepare, promote the conservative treatment in all cases. Uh, this, this graphic represents the, the COVID card. Uh, 
this is, uh, as you know, this is the, uh, the number of patients that ended in the, in the emergency room. As you know, uh, after the 3rd of March, decreased a lot, okay? Uh, this is the, 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 the activity in, in Spain, our country. And also, uh, we have to, to prepare some old techniques that we don't remember probably. Um, um, are, yeah, all, all they are, all the past, I, I need to, to restart again, okay? Uh, about surgeries, uh, non-OG and elective surgery was postponed. Um, only day surgery, trauma infection, and tumor surgery was done. Uh, this is the number of surgeries uh, performed in this period. In blue, the normal uh, activity. Um, in red, the activity during this period. Okay. As you know, it's very, 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 very low uh, activity. Uh, as you know, after February, the activity decreased a lot, okay? especially in the second uh, week of March. And as you know, uh, the decrease was 40% in March and 70% in April. For a uh, private party, this is a, a great disaster, okay. Uh, this is the type of patient that we uh, uh, treated in the emergency room, yeah. you know, uh, hips in, in elderly patients, uh, a lot of fracture, of course, and surgery fracture. Uh, this is the, the types of fracture that we attended. Uh, as you know, the one third of, of this was in the in the hand, hand surgery, hand injuries. Okay, and the most popular is the, the hip fracture. Uh, of course, this type of fracture was the increase respect the last year in this in the same period, and the risk is the is practically the same results in this uh, between the two periods. Um, as I told you, uh, the hand surgery was the uh, one third of the uh, patient that we treated during this uh, pandemic uh, uh, period. This is the, the, the fracture that I, I we, that we treat in this uh, period. Uh, amputations, uh, of course, as you know, uh, the people stay at home too much time. And we have a lot of uh, uh, boxer uh, fracture. And of course, uh, nerves, uh, tendons, serrations, amputation, it is. Um, about uh, the management of, of our people, we mind this, this, uh, this scheme because uh, for us, the best idea is to protection for the patient, for the surgeon, of course, to the legal, legal uh, problems because Actually, in this case, in this time, we only are in being mind with the coronavirus, but uh, it's very important to, to be in mind also the legal uh, uh, question for the post-COVID period. Okay. This is the typical protection that other uh, speakers done and told about this, uh, with surgical gown, gown, gloves, surgical mask, etc. But in some cases, uh, we need a handmade, uh, a homemade protection. Uh, 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 tools protection as a uh, uh, trust box uh, in the in the food it is because not all the all the day all the moments we have the, the same uh, uh, material the good material and about the patients in all cases we have the same protocol okay uh, the preventive care is in the normal with a specific PSER test okay and the dimmer with x-ray um, in some cases, uh, a CT scan of the thorax, uh, or thorax uh, CT scan, and of course, uh, informed consent about the surgical procedure and specific for this type of pandemic. In case of PCR positive, uh, there are the active the COVID-19 protocol with uh, isolation measures for patient and family and staff uh, in a specific area of the hospital, a specific uh, uh, intensive care unit, and joined uh, in collaboration with the internal medicine staff. So it's a, 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 a teamwork in this case. Okay. Uh, if, the, if the PCR was negative, a conventional protocol with a, another special area for uh, COVID-free area uh, for uh, lungs, uh, beds, uh, uh, if you need, uh, if the patient needs uh, uh, the equal, it is okay. And this case, only uh, management by the orthopedic surgeon. But this situation 
uh, that was very, very useful because there are uh, a lot of patients with, uh, with DAPS. For example, patients with asymptomatic, no fever, no uh, respiratory disease, with a negative PCR, but a uh, very doubtful chest X-ray with a TTS scan positive and the dimmer elevated, leukocytosis, etc. In this case, we treat the uh, patient as a COVID-19 positive protocol. Okay? Of course, anesthesia, we use only local, regional, uh, well and technique, okay? in uh, all cases, in hand surgery. Um, about the surgical practice, uh, you, we use uh, that every every case need okay there are no different protocol the same implant we don't change the, the plate for keep white etc uh, we promote the, 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 the use of single use implants and in this period we don't have any problem with the stock uh, implants um, of course the number of staff of people during surgery are the minimum okay? uh, about the, the surgical instruments after surgery especially in patients uh, with a positive uh, PCR or suspicious PCR or COVID positive. Uh, after surgery, the, the, the operating room was closed for two hours, okay? Uh, with a special uh, uh, safety circuit for uh, wasting the, the instrumental um, etc. okay? And all the, the consumables was with sodium hypochlorite uh, with this uh, rating. About complication, no complication was observed in this patient. Uh, only two patients with uh, problem, health problems uh, have uh, increased and improved uh, these, these problems. Okay? Because, as you know, the COVID is a, a, a very important uh, uh, inflammatory crisis and this very, very uh, has uh, caused a lot of problems. <laughs> but for us, the, 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 the most frequent complication is was with the patient and the family of the patient because there are a lot of problems with communication. Uh, it, uh, um, it was a very difficult relationship between the family and our staff. Um, the last one, what about the restarting activity? Uh, this is the Spanish cases, uh, the evolution of the new cases and deaths in Spain. And actually, we are in this uh, part of the curve, okay? Uh, probably at the end, I, we don't know. By this reason, the government, the Spanish government, prepare four phases for uh, recovering the activity, especially the, the social and economy activity. And actually, this is dates of uh, updated to, 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 to today. Uh, in red, you have the, the, the excuse me, in, in orange, you have the areas of Spain that they are in phase one. In this case, the people uh, can go to little shops uh, or etc. But actually, the red one is a five phase zero. Uh, of course, Madrid, Catalonia, uh, some parts of Andalusia uh, was closed, and we are also a stay at home. Okay. Um, for us, uh, we prepare safety circuits for low, with low pressure, uh, pressure of COVID-19, uh, especially office area and operation rooms. All our faculty was tested uh, about demolulins M and G promote video and teleconsultations. And we start uh, two uh, weeks ago with low aggressive surgery. As you know, uh, carpal tunnel release, uh, trigger finger, wrist arthroscopy, etc. Of course, with Wallan, local and, and regional anesthesia, and all patients uh, were started with the PCR uh, 48 hours before surgery. Uh, using this, this is our dates actually. We are increased the number of surgery, but all surgeries are very safe. And of course, this is the, the, the office uh, area with uh, exposed space to the patient that is a, a low exposure to COVID 19 uh, area. Okay. And all the patients that we treat in the operation room have uh, his masks are we protected. And uh, with surgery, we use two masks, okay? The, the one in 95%, uh, the 95 mask, uh, the conventional mask, and, and the loops. Okay, uh, this uh, problem is a great problem, okay? But uh, as Spider-Man said, a great power comes with responsibility, okay? Uh, it's very important to, to have a team work, to have a, team, a, a great uh, uh, team, okay? Um, of course, uh, 
United, we, we can, and uh, probably we, we win. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Pedro, for the excellent presentation. Really very nice, very good presentation indeed. And um, yeah, it, the next speaker, Vicente could open up his microphone. Yeah, now? OK. Yeah, yeah. it's OK. Yeah. Yeah. Muy bien, sí. Yes, yes. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, Andrew, and Paul, you for the invitation to participate in this in this uh, le with the lecture in this in this meeting. Uh, so uh, my name is Vicente Catalá. I work in Valencia in a private hospital also in, in Quirón Salud, Valencia. It's a not very big hospital uh, in the middle of the of the center of the of the city. So we are starting. Uh, we are going to to explain uh, more or less how we, how are we organizing uh, doing the organization of the, the scheduling of the of the, the next weeks and what, what we are doing now because we are starting to to do uh, some elective surgeries. Uh, we started last week. We are going. To, uh, I'm going to explain how we are scheduling the, the, the these patients and how is the how is the the, the procedure. Uh, which cases are candidates for surgeries? For us, we are starting, uh, of course, as, as, as everyone is, is telling and in, in their lectures uh, with the emergency cases. Those cases that is not possible to delay the surgery, uh, doing all patient surgery and ambulatory surgery, and trying to, to escape all patients uh, under 65 years, if it's possible. We're trying to avoid all patients uh, comorbidity like diabetes, obesity, uh, so, so on, and procedures re requiring overnight, if it's possible, we're trying to, to avoid this, and procedures requiring general anesthesia. So, uh, we're trying to perform the procedures that can be done under local anesthesia with volant and nerve and nerve block. How we are going? Well, we are organizing the surgical schedule, and we we'll try not to overcrowd the, the list of the surgery. Uh, we are going to schedule maximum three or four patients per, per list per, per OR. Uh, no long procedure, uh, as uh, Pedro uh, has explained. Small procedures like like carpal tunnel through the finger and some police uh, endoscopy too with outpatient surgery, if it's possible, and trying to stick to the schedule. Very, very important to follow the, the, the time from the admission until the surgery, and then the time that the patient uh, remains at the hospital until the discharge. So uh, from the indication until the surgery, uh, we're going to, to do uh, three, three steps. The first is the, the, the pre-op, as, as is the, the same as, as before, as usual, but with uh, the first screen, and it's, it's an specific questionnaire about symptoms, about, uh, about uh, things uh, uh, related to COVID-19. So uh, 48, uh, 72 hours before the surgery, uh, the patient comes to the hospital for a PCR test, and uh, 24 hours before the surgery, uh, the, the patient receives a phone call with a second screening questionnaire uh, related uh, again with uh, COVID symptoms and, and if the, the temperature, fever, and and then uh, we arrive to the day of the until the day two of the surgery. But before uh, 24 hours of uh, before the surgery, uh, also the the patient receives a, a phone call explaining. The, the another phone call explaining all the process, explaining the exact time of arrival to the hospital because uh, it's very important the coordination with the OR schedule. Trying to to that the patient stay at the hospital the, uh, the shortest time as possible. Uh, uh, explaining that he can come, uh, they can come to the hospital with maximum one one companion, but it's better with without without any companion. Uh, and also we do the pre-admission, that is that we, uh, by phone, we take all the personal information and we, uh, the patient has the, the, the room assignated and, and everything. So 
uh, trying to avoid the time that, that, that he's going to wait until the, until the admission in the hospital. So uh, when, when the patient arrives at the hospital, uh, the temperature is taken uh, to the patient and to the companion. Uh, there is another basic questionnaire that, uh, made by the, by the doctor and an X-ray, a net test X-ray. And then if everything is positive, if everything is okay, there is a safe circuit uh, to, the, to the hospital room with uh, different uh, corridors and a personal elevator uh, to arrive to the, to the rooms uh, designated for, the, for, the, for this, this kind of, so, of patients. But what happens if, it, if it's the patient is in an emergency? So uh, there is two, two types of these of this patients, uh, surgery that can be delayed, or so, uh, it's not possible to delay the surgery. All the patients uh, we do all the, in all the patients the PCR test in, in the emergency room. So if it's positive, if it's positive but uh, can be delayed, of course we delay the surgery uh, until the PCR, the PCR is, is negative. But uh, if it's positive or we don't know, we don't have time to know the results of the PCR, of the PCR every patient is treated as positive with all the uh, mes uh, security measures that we have to, to, to implant. So um, about the, uh, the OR organization, we have a specific OR, which is isolated for COVID uh, uh, positive patient or patient suspect in suspicion of, of, of COVID positive. So uh, we follow the time, we try to follow the time planning and schedule order uh, in coordination with mission. Uh, inside the OR, we have only the essential staff, uh, the surgeon, the assistant, the nurse, and the sociologist, but only the essential staff, no residents, no visitors, and, and etc. Yeah, about anesthesia, as I told you before, we try to, to do the, the surgery under local anesthesia, one of procedures on air block, and with all the security measures, depending the, the best results. Uh, the security measures, uh, you were talking about the, the drilling and the aerosols. Is uh, even if the if the risk is low, but there is a risk that, that the drilling or the management of the, the bone can generate aerosols. So uh, we have to be uh, uh, we have to know that, and we have to to be to be to have a, a, a protection. Any patient suspected of being positive must be treated as positive. And the personal protective equipment is the patient not always wears a surgical mask, and the surgeons with N95 is the same as FP2 and surgical mask also, Google's and face and face shield. And after the surgery, the time the patient remains in the hospital should be as short as possible. So depending the procedure, the patient is discharged immediately or after a short time in short time in, in the room. And we have another safe circuit to leave to leave the hospital. Uh, about the post-operative visits, the first or, or two, uh, or the first and the second post-operative visits, we are doing the visits in person, except the positive cases. And after that, uh, as soon as possible, we change to online or phone visits to control the post-operative uh, uh, evolution. About our, our experience, uh, we started with the elective uh, surgeries uh, two weeks ago, last week, uh, uh, two weeks ago. And uh, we have done 21 surgeries from the uh, beginning, the 14th of March uh, until today. Uh, eight, em eight emergency cases reduced the number uh, due to lockdown, uh, luckily. Five of these emergency cases tested negative, so we performed the surgery without problems, and three tested positive, but the three patients were asymptomatic. Uh, of, of these three tested positive, uh, in two cases where it was not possible to delay the surgery, it was one was a wrist open fracture dislocation and an elbow septic uh, uh, arthritis. So we performed the surgery and the other case was possible to delay, was a distal radius fracture. So we did the surgery two weeks later after the, uh, the patient was in good condition and the PCR was, was negative. All the three patients tested negative two or three weeks later with no COVID complications. Uh, of all the patients tested, neg tested negative uh, to date, the patient has had any symptoms after surgery. And about the staff, we are a small team, only uh, three, three surgeons and two, and two nurses in the, and one th hand therapist, so we are a small team. So the, sta the staff more or less is involved in every, in every procedure. Um, 
in in our staff by now we don't have any symptoms and we have we have had the serological and PCR test last week and by now uh, there is no, no infection. So this is our experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vicente. It's a very nice presentation and overview of the lecture. So we got to we move on, Alex. Alex is ready. Yes. Um, thank you, Andrea, uh, for uh, letting me share our experience and for learning so much from all my colleagues all around the world. And as Pedro uh, already said, that this is the terrible situation that we have been facing in Spain for the last uh, weeks. Uh, we have had more than uh, uh, 35,000 uh, deaths uh, because of COVID-19. And as we have said, we're still in phase in Barcelona. Um, I, I probably can describe the situation of many uh, surgeons, not, not only hand surgeons in, in our country. I have two jobs, actually. I work in a public hospital, which is this one. It's a huge one. It's the biggest in the city. It has the particularity that the uh, the building that it's pointing with the arrow, it's a trauma building and it's separated from the rest of the buildings in the hospital. And then I have um, my private practice in Kaplan Institute, which is uh, the one that you see here. So um, how COVID-19 changed our activity? Well, uh, the big wave came from a little bit later from uh, in Spain that it started in Italy. And in the hospital, we have the first patient at the beginning of March. Uh, in our trauma building, it was the 12th of March. And then uh, the elective surgery stopped one day before. And the outpatient clinic uh, was closed and just uh, being used for emergencies just four days after. Uh, the elective surgery stop. And this is more or less how we change our activity in the last one month and a half. In the public uh, hospital, uh, the decrease was uh, around 20% of what we did before. But as you see in our private practice, it was dramatically going down. So it has uh, really had a really, really big impact uh, in our daily practice. Um, what type of procedures uh, were, we, were we allowed to do in the public hospital? Um, mainly, as uh, all of you have said, trauma and infections. Everybody says tumor, but uh, we don't have um, poison tumors to operate as has occurred many times. What we have done in surgeries, uh, all the surgeries we were done by experienced surgeons, but uh, in, in the big orthopedic department in which I work, all the surgeons that we were considered uh, at risk, that means uh, close to 60 year olds, they, they were not going to any uh, COVID area or uh, risk area, including surgery. We changed a little bit, well, not, not a little bit, we changed a lot of our indications for uh, fractures, like distal radius fractures, and we were doing a lot of conservative treatment, because probably we would operate in other circumstances. And obviously, doing uh, outpatient surgery every time that is possible. And in the trauma building that you saw, we usually have uh, 13 hours daily, and it was reduced to three hours in the peak time. What were the logistics uh, in in the public hospital? Uh, I'm not talking any uh, about anything in my private practice, just in public hospital, the university hospital. Uh, we really have to face to uh, the circumstance that the, there was a new hospital that was rebuilt in a few weeks. So you can see on the pictures on the left side, this is a, sur a surgical simulation area that we had uh, sharing with general surgeons. And in, 40, in 48 hours, less than two days, it was a, a ICU with two beds and that was available for the patients to come. It all do change in terms of logistics that uh, we were meeting daily with all the chief of units, uh, with a, a teleconference, with a video conference, in order to support uh, all of us and then share the workload, especially with our chief of department. 
And we started all the scientific activity as, uh, as soon as possible using uh, uh, telecommunication tools. And a, a good thing that happened in our hospital is that we, we daily have uh, really accurate information from institution. And this is, I think this is crucial for people working in big institutions. And, and as you may see here, for example, in date uh, April the 2nd, uh, at that time we had uh, 170 patients in our critical units and uh, more than 700 patients uh, in the hospital. How did we manage, sorry, how did we manage the staff? The staff, the staff was only screened if the, if the uh, doctor had symptoms. Isolation when you have contacts with a, a COVID positive uh, was only done at the beginning. We work for the first week or 10 days in two, two separate teams in each unit, but then uh, we had to start supporting uh, COVID critical areas. So uh, we were not able to do uh, work into, into separate teams. Uh, we have only been testing serologically for the last week. And in our department, we are uh, summing staff and residents, around 80 orthopedic surgeons and seven surgeons get infected. I think this is really high, but all of them were infected on the first 10 days. And I think this is, this is a big mistake. So when we had to start to uh, support the uh, COVID critical areas at the beginning, we were just doing paperwork, telephone calls to uh, families or whatever, so closing working close to anesthesiologist and intensive care people, but then it changed very fast. And after a few days, uh, we were no longer hand surgeons, we were no longer orthopedic surgeons, and then we have to uh, uh, directly help uh, with uh, COVID patients management. That, that was my team. Uh, and this guy here was my medical student, uh, like 10 or 15 years ago, now it's an intensive care specialist. So he was my chief. And that, that was an intense personal experience, as you may see in the pictures. This is me on the first day, when I went into the COVID uh, boxes, mm -hmm. and this is uh, uh, in day 17. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm the one in both pictures. So you see how, how this really happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of uh, patient management, uh, all patients coming to the hospital, uh, to the trauma hospital, they had a PCR screening, but just one and a chest X-ray uh, if they had to have surgery. Uh, as all of you have said, if the patient was positive or if we have any suspicion, we were using PPE. In the OR, uh, less people as possible in a specially prepared OR, avoiding sedation, general anesthesia, if it's possible, and uh, patients the less time in the hospital as possible. And during this time, we, we had uh, to do 21 uh, surgeries in, in my unit, but the whole general orthopedic department, uh, then we all did 140. Just two of our patients were COVID-19 positive, and for the rest of the 140 surgeries, 22. And we had no patient with positive PCR after this hospitalization. And what, what's going to be coming for the future? Well, right now, today's data, this morning data, in, in our hospital, we still have more than 100 COVID patients and almost 40 are still in critical areas, only 14 in, in our building. And we are recovering the OWARS. Next, next week, we will have 11 OWARS. Usually, we have 13. And in June, we are expected to be back in you know, normal activity. Um, in the outpatient clinics, we're increasing the numbers in, in two weeks, probably, and uh, they will all have a separate uh, a path to come to, to, visit, uh, to visit that. But I think this is too optimistic, honestly. I think, I don't know if it's, come, it's going to come a second wave of cases, but I think this is too optimistic. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, if you, Mireya, please, would you like to recap a few questions? Uh... I think that there's a, que a, a special thing that uh, is interesting. Pedro has told us about a specific covenant consentment, and perhaps he has a 
talked about it too too lightly and, and we we could focus then or now on this aspect uh, probably we can move on now and uh, ask okay. the next speaker to yeah. introduce himself okay great now fernando fernando corella corella let's go fernando Do you hear me? Yeah, so thank you, Andrea and Andrew, for the invitation. This is a different lecture for, for the previous one because it's more about a general experience than about hand surgery. But I think it's a really good idea to share bad situations to know what COVID can do with, with your hospital. I work in two different hospitals in Madrid. This first one is the biggest private hospital in Madrid. It is located in the northwest side of the city. And my second hospital is this one. It's a medium-sized public hospital that covers a population of 300,000 people. And it's located in the southeast side of the city. As Pedro showed you, in Madrid we have suffered a really high incidence of cases especially during this month, from the 15th of March to the 25th of April. There was no public or private medicine or hospital work together against the COVID, but the pressure has been different between areas. In this graphic, you can see the percentage of occupation uh, in COVID patient in each, uh, in each hospital. So this is the occupations of my private hospital. Um, here you can see the hospital reached a 100% occupation in COVID patients. The organization management of hand surgery is really the same as Pedro has told you or, or within the has told you. So I would like to focus in my experience in a public hospital collapse during the next four minutes. Because this is the pressure that we have in this hospital. We reach the 200% of, of uh, occupation. And these are the posts of the other 30 hospitals in Madrid. So, as you can see, we have been the most pressured one. In fact, we were the first hospital to be declared as a 100% COVID hospital. And that means no other medical or surgical activity could be done. But why have we had so many COVID uh, patients? Well, this black area here, is the area that covers the hospital. So on the 6th of April, we have nearly 3,000 patients over a total of 21,000 patients. That means that 30% of a big city with a high number of cases. But these are only numbers. Uh, what this <laughs> is uh, that we were really in the first line of fire in a war, especially during this awful month. Uh, with a two percent uh, by two increase of patients each day, with a total number of patients more than three thousand patients in the hospital, and more than uh, uh, two thousand and one admitted patients, and with many many casualties, not only in the patients but also in doctors. Especially in my department, the thirty percent of us has been infected during this period. So we need to double the number of beds or triple the number of beds, cover all the OR into clinical care spaces, and all the staff uh, work together, no matter your specialty, against the COVID. But despite the worst situation, we were really well organized. Specifically, surgeons were divided into three groups, as, as, um, uh, as you can see, COVID medical care. So that was attending directly medical patients, one group, COVID with critics uh, like Alex has showed you, and another group of, of surgeons that do activities of non medical care, uh, calling families uh, and things like that. Uh, I was volunteer for treating patients, and believe me, that was the hardest month of my life, not because of the management of patients, everything was perfectly protocolized, and we were always supervised by an internal medicine specialist, but because most, well, I think most of hand surgeons are not mentally prepared to deal with the death, unless with so many deaths. So it's true um, 
that sometimes out of your comfort zone something good can happen and that was to see our workers of the same hospital fighting in the same direction that was to save as many lives as possible. So in this terrible situation, what about trauma patients? Well, because of the lockdown, uh, there are less patients, there are less traffic, sport and work injuries, and obviously as we were a 100% COVID hospital, no ambulance brings us patients. So during this period, we have only treated 390 patients in the, in the emergency room, 85 of them with hand pathology, more than 70% of them with real fracture that had uh, that we will operate in, in, in another situation, but we have treated most of them conservatively, and only seven patients were referred to another hospital to do to do a surgery. So in just one month, we passed from fighting for a one millimeter step off of a fracture in the distal radio to treat all fracture with a cast and fight for the life of the patients. Fortunately, on Monday we will begin the surgical activity again with all the precautions you can imagine. We are not really in phase zero. I think we are in phase less one, and, and we will operate only the emergency cases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, so, as agreed, we work on um, we work on with the program to ask um, Franco Bassetto to give his presentation. Yes, yes, okay. it's okay. So, uh, thank you uh, very much. We ask uh, to be first for the Italian experience because uh, there is an overlapping for my residents uh, with uh, another uh, very interesting uh, uh, webinar. So, uh, we work uh, in uh, Padova University and uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, Padova was the first town in which uh, we have the first Italian death due to COVID-19. Immediately, it was uh, Friday and uh, uh, the commitment of our hospital call all the uh, head of nurses and all the chief of um, all the uh, departments for a special um, meeting in which uh, they uh, decide to uh, in immediately begin uh, the action of protect protection. So in plastic surgery we decide immediately to uh, found a special group in uh, our activity that we call Plastic Surgeons Against COVID. That was a group dedicated uh, uh, to research, but even and especially in the first week uh, to the reorganization of the activity during the pandemic uh, period. And uh, uh, you know that uh, 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 and, uh, our hospital has a, a policy that was uh, considered a very proper policy to maintain a very low rate of uh, infected, especially in uh, professional health. And uh, uh, the policy from uh, the beginning was uh, to uh, try to perform the so-called swab PCR policy. So try to uh, test every patient uh, that arrived to the hospital like an asymptomatic potential positive patients. This was possible because of a well basic organization in the microbiology unit and in the labs unit that at the end had, has good results during the two very huge months of pandemic. In our hospital we have 7,500 workers that were screened from the beginning and with a very low positivities, 1.86, the, me the medium rate in the same time in Italy was 15%. And uh, uh, the other uh, activity that was immediately decided was that after every positive case, all contacts underwent to daily swab for one, two weeks after exposure. So the uh, first uh, uh, 
idea was protection, protection for uh, patients admitted to the hospital for uh, every, um, every uh, disease or not only for suspectus of uh, COVID-19. And uh, uh, this is what uh, we have published even in a PRS, uh, that was uh, how the hospital uh, mean for uh, protection first. For the uh, patients, uh, immediately there was uh, a task force that uh, organized uh, a so-called pre-admission COVID uh, uh, risk assessment that was organized in tents that uh, were outside of the hospital. Then uh, every uh, activity of surgery was uh, reassessment immediately the uh, elective surgery was stopped so for uh, our activity in which uh, we have 20 uh, percent of all the plastic surgery activity is dedicated to hand surgery uh, was completely uh, reorganized immediately even for the patients uh, the uh, hospital decided that only one relative assistance was uh, admitted and all everyone were masked during surgery if you remember at the beginning uh, this was not well accepted all over the world because there was huge uh, discussion if this COVID-19 was like a flu or like uh, a SARS but from the beginning, our hospital understand the, drama, the dramatic situation that uh, could develop um, after the first notice of the first death. What was the uh, policy for healthcare provider? Immediately, uh, um, the, uh, the uh, chief of the hospital decided that all the meeting must be shorter than 15 minutes and we began from the beginning to use telemedicine uh, for patients and uh, even for meetings between all the staff. Uh, all the operating rooms uh, had uh, reduced the regime in our activity. We have four uh, operating rooms for day. We, we reduced of 50% this activity only to um, for hand surgery. Uh, they, they were dedicated only to emergency. Always, all the healthcare provi uh, provider uh, wear masks, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, for, from the beginning, we uh, decide that uh, surgical mask would be uh, sufficient for our patients and for healthcare. But in case of uh, patients at suspect, uh, from the beginning, the FP2 were introduced. And then the policy of uh, screening swab uh, PCR for all. It, uh, maybe you, uh, all of you know that uh, this was uh, huge discussed by uh, scientists uh, that uh, had different opinion in Italy if uh, uh, to perform screening only in uh, symptomatic patients or in all patients admitted to the hospital. And this was the decision from uh, Padua. For everything that have, was admitted as patients, as healthcare provider, or as a relative person, the safety distance uh, were introduced from uh, the beginning. The policy for washing and sanit sanitize the um, operating room in with special uh, groups dedicated to sanification. The uh, necessary for wear surgical masks for everyone and uh, uh, the epidemiology unit from uh, the beginning uh, began a policy of teaching to everyone the uh, what were the risk for uh, contact so it was a policy of uh, education to uh, to people that, to sanitary people that were involved and uh, obviously the temperature monitoring. What happened, uh, what was our experience uh, in these two months? We decided to do, um, to, uh, do an analysis of uh, 
a month in, the, in this month in the last four years. And uh, uh, as you can see here, as you can see, uh, we are a hub uh, hospital in our region for hand surgery. We have the same number of uh, procedures of uh, uh, emergency surgery. And uh, uh, it's like we had a slight increase in home related trauma related to the fact that uh, people do it to, your, to yourself at home during the lockdown. But if you go uh, to see all the, these numbers, we see that uh, the minor uh, procedures uh, uh, remain uh, the same in hand surgery and uh, we have uh, more proceed we, we we have no elective hand surgery in this uh, period but the traumatic number of patients admitted for hand surgery was 68 so exactly uh, the same in the other in the other years in the same month how uh, to de how to deal with patients during the uh, pandemic. Unfortunately, we are late, but uh, we uh, decide to uh, share our experience uh, with uh, uh, this uh, paper that was published uh, uh, last week, uh, the, and uh, now it's available uh, on uh, 4 of May on hand surgery and the rehabilitation. But I think that this is uh, a summary about uh, our policy in South in, with hand surgery patients. We divide them in two uh, groups, uh, trauma cases and elective cases. We, ca we, are, um, um, we now can perform elective cases only uh, from last Monday. So what is uh, the uh, algorithm about elective cases? We uh, perform through our residents a COVID-19 risk pattern interview and uh, at home. And if from this interview, we understand that we have a low risk patients uh, that is negative to all uh, question, they are uh, treated and immediately dismissed uh, if we are not, if, if we are in condition not to perform our, our a PCR. On the other hand, if we have a high suspicion index, so a, posit a positive answer, at least one of uh, the question, the patients are managed with eye protection PPI from the, uh, the, the uh, beginning, and uh, they go to a fast SARS swab and treated after negative results. So for elective cases, now the policy of our hospital is uh, to perform the PCR in the two days before elective surgery. What happened when we had a trauma? In case of uh, trauma, we divide our patients in three groups. Patients with minor procedures, uh, we uh, decide that they don't need immediate uh, treatment, uh, especially if uh, we, we uh, think that we can have aerosol generating uh, procedure. And for, uh, for this, we try to maintain them not hospitalized patients. So uh, immediately they go on through a COVID-19 risk pattern interview and if they remain low risk patients negative to all questions, they are treated and uh, immediate, immediately dismissed. The operating room was organized with uh, a reorganization of the um, the admission and the area at risk are not at risk because consider that in the same block we have bothered patients, two of them COVID, uh, <coughs> COVID plus uh, disease and so they go daily in the operating room. So we decide to divide these patients from the other patients treated in plastic surgery. If the patients with minor proced that need minor proced procedure has a high suspicious index uh, at the uh, COVID-19 risk interview, so they are positive at least one of the question, 
PTAs are managed with high protective PPI for all and uh, uh, fast uh, SARS that in our hospital is organized for having answer in two hours uh, is performed and uh, the patients are treated after uh, results in the dedicated uh, operating room. If we have patients that need hospitalization because the trauma is more important, first of all, they are admitted to a fast SARS-CoV-2 swab and admitted in a suspected COVID-dedicated area and treated after swab result in the dedicated uh, operating room. What happened for real emergency patients that need, uh, for example, reimplantation or revascularization? In uh, this time, uh, as you have seen before, we had, uh, we had uh, a huge number, like in the last uh, years uh, of uh, revascularization and even an important uh, forearm reimplantation. If uh, we know that this patient can go to aerosol generating uh, procedure and uh, for this uh, um, reason we think that they, they are high suspicious risk uh, patients, uh, they are treated before test result with high protective PPI and uh, we perform the fast, the fast SARS uh, PCR swap over that generally arrive in two hours. So, uh, in case of immediate treatment injuries, implantation and revascularization, can't wait for swab. This was the experience in uh, these two uh, months and we want to go on with this uh, policy and uh, we must uh, treat them as positive. Uh, what to do now in the phase two? We began it only for uh, one week. Uh, surely we are uh, investing a lot in the telephone triage of the risk, consider fever, cough, diarrhea, conjunctivitis, risk contact. This can, uh, at the beginning, uh, help us to organize the pre-admission moment that uh, at the end uh, has the swab in the uh, 24 hours before uh, surgery. The policy of our hospital is uh, consider every patient admitted as an asymptomatic potential positive patients for uh, this uh, um, reason, you know that the Padova policy is a preoperative swab test for all in the pre-admission or in the in emergency uh, department. So I uh, thank you and uh, now... Prossimo relatore, eh, lascio, parliamo, uh, chiediamo la parola a Dr. Tos di presentarci la sua esperienza al al Gaetano Pini. Hello everybody, I hope you can show the, uh, see the screen, you see that? You better share it. Yeah. Not really? Yeah. Yes, it's okay. Is the screen? Okay. Yeah, we can see. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I really put five minutes, no more. I'm sorry that uh, Roberto cannot share his experience because there was the presentation that show how big the impact on our activity in the north of Italy, in this, like in Spain. So I am lucky, I am one of the hospitals that are more lucky in the world because I am without an intensive care, so the region asked to us with uh, Dr. Lazzarini uh, to do uh, a hub of trauma hospital in Lombardy and in Milan. So my hospital is COVID free. We have uh, up to 20 COVID patients now, but all these patients are uh, became COVID positive after the hospitalization. So we did in seven weeks, eight surgical procedure. That is nothing. Normally we have 35 to 45 operations per week. And we operate like 
Sempre stati dei messaggi mentre stavo cercando di gestire la tua lezione, sarebbe stato meglio continui. Comunque, visto che abbiamo fatto Now we are thinking to do the second phase. We have the possibility to divide the hospital in a clean part and in one for COVID. And uh, as all speakers said, uh, we have two different pathways for admission and two different pathways for surgery. In the first phase, uh, the screening uh, was present only if you had symptoms, and this was a disaster also for clinicians. We had 20% of uh, uh, staff that was uh, uh, COVID positive. And uh, up to five weeks now, we do all the screening of the staff and we are going very better. For the COVID surgical room, I decide that uh, the director and the youngest of the team were good to go in that direction. There is less possibility to have uh, infection for the staff in this way. We do not have uh, uh, different staff um, um, and, and different rotation for the staff. All training has done for the staff to avoid infection. And we have two staff members that have been contacted contact the COVID in the first uh, three weeks and one resident on four. So two on 10 and one on four. So we, we, we operate, the patient has uh, had uh, so up to now. So if you can, we can not do the anesthesia, is intubation is better. We do all surgery as rapid as possible. We do absorbable suture teleconsulting and few counter after surgery if it's possible. Uh, we don't do something different than our uh, Fantastic presentation that I saw up to now. Fernando. And uh, the equipment at the moment are very nice, but in the first two weeks we were really without uh, weapons. Outpatients are limited, only in and tentative screening is uh, capture and the handling of the, of the patient. And uh, really, I have to thank Andrea and all foreigners and friends because uh, it's very important for us to share their experience that, that is much bigger than our experience. So, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Toss. Sorry. Um, Alberto Lazzarini, can you please try and join us? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Thank you. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yes. Please. Okay, okay, okay. So, the Galeazzi Hospital is an old orthopedic hospital in Milan that is desperately searching space and there's no room to expand the hospital where it is. So it's moving in 2021 to the new building that you see here. This is important to say because at the moment it was not intended to be a change in structure, but in fact, with the coronavirus, we had to change the hospital, the old building. This is the overall uh, activity we have you see 17,000 procedures a year in normal condition. Hand surgery does about 10%, but the percentage of trauma is much higher for hand than for any other uh, unit, excluding the trauma unit, of course. <clears throat> this is how the hospital was uh, organized in the past. You see many other hospitals, uh, wards and uh, operating uh, theaters and services and outpatient clinics. We had, uh, as being a very old hospital, we had our operating theaters divided into three uh, blocks in two different floors. And it was uh, very useful in this period, as we will see. Uh, in Italy, the healthcare is managed ma uh, mostly by local uh, government. And local government in Lombardy decided to design a specialized hospital 
to manage um, particular uh, pathologies. And in fact, Galeazzi and Gaetano Pini, where um, Dr. Toss works, uh, were designed as a hub for trauma cases. So we had to collect all the trauma cases sent from all the other hospitals that were fed up with COVID patients uh, in, a, in, in a catch of about 5 million people. <clears throat> so we had to build a hospital into the hospital to host COVID patients. And uh, as you see here, the hospital has been changed a lot. And uh, fortunately, since our uh, orthopedic, uh, with our operating theaters were divided into uh, three different floors, we could uh, um, create a, a COVID operating theater, a non-COVID operating theater, and a COVID and non-COVID ICU unit in different places. And of course, we had to create a quarantine ward and a COVID ward. These are the new rules for outpatients, and only the main entrance of the hospital has been used, and uh, only patients could add into the hospital, no visitors were allowed, and uh, this uh, temperature scanning questionnaire were asked to every patient. Questionnaire was uh, due to uh, check if patient had contact or in the past with the possible uh, infected people or relatives, or if he had if he, he has traveled abroad in the past. And uh, in outpatient clinic, only postoperative and urgent cases were uh, accepted, uh, where urgent cases were malignancies and spine cases with neurological involvement. The admission to the hospital were divided into COVID ward and ICU, where COVID patient, pure COVID patient, and trauma patient with symptoms or positives were were. Then, and non-COVID wards where non-COVID trauma patients were sent. So we have two different hospitals with separate paths. This is the overall um, pathway of the patients, and these different paths were divided by solid wards that have been created into the hospital. Lift, stairs, and the corridors and wards were uh, solidly and physically divided. Emergency, um, when we had emergent cases that could not be uh, uh, checked for COVID or if uh, they were known as being COVID, they were sent to the COVID operating theater. And also the surgical were changed, as you have heard from the other colleagues. This was the way we worked in pre-COVID uh, period. And uh, in the non-COVID operating theater, we all uh, wear SS, SFP2 masks. As you know, when you wear them, you have to forget you have a nose. And in COVID operating theater, we have all the specific PPI, PPE devices and the dressing and undressing uh, procedures and then contamination and separate pace from all the other uh, colleagues. In this chart, you see the rise in the first seven weeks of the phase one period of uh, uh, urgent cases. The urgent cases per, uh, percentage in the hospital has rise to cover almost all the cases we treated. And in hand surgery, we treated uh, 54 surgical procedures, all traumatic cases, because elective cases were not allowed. We had only three COVID patients and those that we operated. And uh, uh, we have most fractures, uh, 51 fractures, two fingertip injuries, and one microsurgical reconstruction. What we have observed in case specification is a decrease in work-related and traffic injuries, of course, because people were staying home, and an increase in domestic injuries, as it has already been said. 90% of our fractures were low-energy risk fractures. And uh, consider that uh, the 51 cases that I have uh, um, of uh, risk fractures that I have described are only those that we have treated surgically out of 250 patients that came with uh, a risk trauma to the emergency department. And uh, we have selected the uh, procedure uh, very carefully, uh, trying to 
uh, go over our uh, normal indication to surgery. And also the mean age of our patient has rose. Now we started phase two. Step phase two in our country started last week and uh, in our hospital we will start uh, with the new rules uh, in, in next weeks. So we are trying to decrease or exclude pure COVID cases that will uh, find room in other hospital. We restart clinics for elective of patients in, uh, on uh, Wednesday and we continue swab screening on all patients admitted. We maintain separate uh, paths for COVID and non-COVID trauma and orthopedic patients, of course. <clears throat> and we will start uh, admission to of elective cases only A and B classes. As uh, Pierluigi has said, A and B classes in Italy means with a waiting list of 30 and 60 days. Our new our outpatients continue to be scanned at the entrance uh, uh, for temperature, and uh, uh, in our clinics we will have one patient every 30 minutes. Uh, all the staff will use uh, FP2 masks and PPE, and sanification of surfaces is made every every consultation. And the outpatient clinic will be open 12 hours a day, six days a week. So this is all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Alberto. Thank you. And um, I think if it's okay, we can move to the uh, presentation from the, the other hand surgery department in Turin. Stefano, you ready? I just put it you here. You can share your screen. Yes. Sharing. Okay, perfect. Good. Can you see me? Yep. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Andrea, and uh, good evening to uh, everybody. So we are in uh, in Turin, in the northwestern part of Italy. Area with, in, uh, where 4.5 million people live, and in this area we had uh, about uh, 20, uh, 28,000 COVID positive patients with uh, 3,000 deaths. But the, the, the curve of uh, COVID 19 are uh, fortunately decreasing. During phase one, according to the local government and hospital, we limited our activity to emergency and urgent procedure. So we operate only uh, trauma, malignant tumors, and non-delayable nerve surgery and microsurgery according to the A and B category of the COVID-19 ESSKA guidelines. Our logistics uh, included uh, COVID-19 hospital ward, uh, and COVID-19 intensive care unit, and an operating theater in emergency department with negative pressure. We had specific COVID-19 hospital pathways, and all patients that were suspected and non-detected uh, for uh, treated for the emergency uh, were treated like uh, COVID-19 positive patients. In this period, the surgical staff was uh, limited uh, as much as possible. Uh, all surgeons used uh, FFP2 mask and or surgical helmets for COVID-19 uh, positive patients. All surgeons who had contact with uh, Positive patients or suspected patients had uh, swabbed or uh, test the SARS-CoV-2. Fortunately, no end surgeons placed in uh, preventive isolation or resulted positive during this phase. What about uh, patient management and outcomes? Well, we uh, had three levels of investigation. The first level with, oh, sorry. Okay, 
The first level with clinical history and clinical investigation is for um, outpatient clinic. The second and third level is for the patient that uh, will uh, undergo surgery. During phase one, we observed a strong decrease in patients visited in our emergency department. And the number of surgical procedures was 73% less compared to the same period of the previous year. Only two patients undergoing urgent end surgery resulted COVID-19 positive. The proposal and organizational model for phase two included an enlargement of surgical activity. In our hospital, um, at present, elective surgery is not allowed, but we consider it for surgery, also urgent somewhat elective surgery, like selected post-trauma, benign tumors, nerve surgery, and microsurgery, according to the ADSC of the ESSKA guidelines. We preserved all the hospital facilities uh, organized during pandemia because of possible future spreading peaks. And we started to select surgical patients according to the uh, fever stratification risk for uh, COVID-19. Obviously, we support telemedicine, outpatient surgery, volant, and peripheral anesthesia. For COVID-19 uh, positive or suspected patients, we continue to use FFP2 for surgical uh, helmet systems, and uh, probably we will have the possibility to, uh, to have this new uh, microscope, the robotic scope, that is a microscope with a remote control that can be used inside the surgical helmets, and it's very comfortable for a, a microsurgical procedure. We started uh, phase two uh, in this week, but in a few days we observed a progressively uh, increase of number of patients accepted in the outpatient clinic. We had more operating theater dedicated to end surgery and now full employment of surgical staff. Uh, moreover, there is uh, uh, in progress a uh, general screening in the hospital of healthcare personnel uh, with the um, real-time PCR COVID-19 detection test. And I finish and uh, many greetings from uh, Turin. Okay, thank you. I'm um, sorry. Thank you for the the very quick um, resume of, of your presentation. And I would like to close up this um, this presentation, uh, inviting to lecture my old friend Antonio Berizzi, which is uh, a um, associate professor at the at the University clinic of uh, Padua, the orthopedic clinic at the University of Padua. They collected a very nice experience and um, they have a quite uh, valuable, uh, developed a quite val a valuable protocol to address uh, um, typically orthopedic patient in these very hard times. Please, Antonio, can you share your screen? Thank you very much, Andrea, for your invitation. I am not an end surgeon. I sometimes do some uh, fracture, metacarpal bones. We do a lot of uh, wrist fracture, but we are not uh, specialized in the hand surgeon. We like this to Franco Bassetto in his, in his care. And we do mostly trauma and uh, general orthopedics in our department. Okay, where can I go? Okay, this is our hospital. We have uh, 1,500 beds, and uh, we have dedicated three floors in the in the block on the right uh, to to COVID patient, and we dedicate also a lot of bed in the intensive care unit, 71 beds, uh, and more than 200 beds for COVID patient. In our uh, department, uh, we considered a COVID-free 
part of the hospital. Also, in the emergency unit, we have divided two different pathways, one for the COVID patient or suspected cases, and one for COVID-3. Uh, our department usually has uh, eight beds, and now they are um, reduced to 30 beds because they need the personnel, to, um, mainly nurses and uh, assistants, uh, go to the COVID area. We have also uh, three operating rooms available 12 hours a day during the normal time, and now we have only two. In, the, in this period of uh, COVID outbreak, uh, we do not separate the keep, and we try to maintain a normal way of working. Uh, residents never stop the service, and uh, we take the daily briefing every morning uh, with only eight members of the staff uh, in a very, very large room with uh, more than two meters between uh, each other and uh, with a face mask on uh, every time. And uh, since March 6, uh, uh, we reduce uh, elective surgery and we stop completely the elective surgery on March 13, except for uh, uh, musculoskeletal tumors, malignant metastasis, and pathological fracture. So we continue to do fracture, and uh, we do not change uh, our operative indication of that. So we do not uh, try to uh, postpone, uh, delay the, the intervention, or give a more conservative indication than the normal time. We continue to do malignant metastasis, and some uh, only four or five in this period, aggressive benign tumors. We do not stop also the activity of bone biopsy and soft tissue biopsy. This is typical kind of patient that we have, uh, mostly ancient uh, people with peripotetic fracture or uh, the long bone uh, fraction and so on. This is a case of sarcoma that we have removed with the entire bone with a, in a reconstructive replacement, bone metastasis with the curettage and bone cement or a nailing in impending fracture. Our uh, outpatient clinic changed a lot. We stopped the first visit for general orthopedics and maintain only that one of oncologic reasons. We do not stop at all routine uh, the post-op check mainly because uh, we try a lot of difficult uh, to have uh, control of the wound uh, in the territories because the, um, the, the general medicine and the nurses in the territories do not uh, uh, allow for this kind of a service. And we have a lot of uh, changes also in the emergency unit. We have a dramatically uh, decrease of uh, patient uh, because maybe of uh, the, the, the fear of COVID patient in the nearby uh, separated uh, emergency department. And this is what we see. We, we see in the emergency room uh, mainly domestic trauma. And this is maybe obvious, uh, go to the restriction that we have to move around. And also this, uh, this uh, reflect uh, of the changes of our activity. In the first month of segregation, we have had 30% uh, uh, less of uh, surgical activity, mainly in the elective surgery that uh, have a, a big, big decrease uh, in numbers. And what we do now, we start uh, uh, at the end of March with accurate screening before admission toward the operating room. And in case of emergency, we consider that all the patients like COVID-19 positive. Uh, we have a uh, right, uh, very clear repetitive instruction for operating room in case of COVID-19 positive patient with a clean pathway, with a uh, dirt pathway, where in the, all, with all the instruction to correct use the, of the DITI. And now for the, uh, and this is, gave us uh, some uh, good results because uh, uh, we have only three COVID uh, positive healthcare staff in the healthcare staff, all uh, asymptomatic, and uh, in the, all the potential contact, uh, there is no, uh, no positive at all. 
Uh, in our hospital, like Professor Bassetto said, we have a, a strictly a program of uh, swab testing of all the personnel every 15 days. And uh, last week we start with the immunological tests. So now for the phase two, we have to uh, implement the procedure that we have and uh, we admit the patient in a different pathway. All the patients that came from the emergency department have uh, as a nasopharyngeal swap in the urgent modality. And we had the response at the, in a time at two to six hours. In emergency, we treat like a COVID-19 positive, but fortunately, till now, we don't have this kind of uh, necessity. From other hospital, we pretend to have uh, a swab done with the result because of our admission. In pediatric patients, Sto they are the same rules, passo, but also the cake giver have uh, a nasopharyngeal swab. And uh, for the... Now we starting for the elective surgery and we don't uh, uh, think to um, make changes and uh, we have only to trace patient and uh, in all the patients that come from home have uh, a nasopharyngeal swab before admission, no more than three days and followed by self quarantine. For the patient field, uh, we have post-op check, first visit, the soft tissue biopsy. Uh, we have uh, admission after body temperature check and amnestic questionnaire, use of indicated DPI and the spacing of the patient Put some uh, advice on the on the seats in the waiting room that uh, don't sit here and keep the space between you. And uh, fortunately, we have only one patient found COVID positive. Uh, fortunately, 15 days after this mission. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, have a good afternoon to all. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you for your lecture. They showed the extreme accuracy you uh, had for the um, uh, prevention of this um, um, COVID spread. And um, well, actually, I will ask Laura a few uh, questions if there are really burning questions here, because I can imagine after almost four years sitting here, re, uh, listening to a very interesting uh, presentation. Everyone is pretty uh, tired and everyone was also very, very committed. Uh, Laura, do you have any questions to forward the experts? Uh, I have just a uh, some comments uh, by Andrew Chin and others uh, for the Bruno Battiston uh, brilliant solution to my procedure by robotics. Yes, especially now we have the possibility to look for new solutions. So I think that uh, robots and uh, new technology, uh, as uh, we are using Zoom, more and more platforms, so robots can give us uh, through. Uh, Bluetooth or other solutions to manage also microsurgery. So we don't need uh, uh, to face a microscope or we, we can keep our head and our body far from the uh, uh, from the operating field. And uh, if now uh, the big global is very expensive, new solutions are less and less expensive and give us this possibility. Okay. Yes, uh, just to add on from what Bruno has uh, uh, sort of showed us the solution, I think I think the Italians have been quite active in using robots for the management of COVID patients from even what I see in the literature that, uh, you know, robots are being used to monitor or to assess a COVID positive patients far away so that uh, the, the staff do not have to have direct contact with the patient. So this is also another, another solution of yours. Uh, then you, you have uh, sort of made it easier for us to, to, to deal with uh, uh, the dangerous threat of COVID-19. And uh, we are waiting for the, the prototype and uh, more, 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 more solutions from, from you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for the very nice comments. And I think we have to 
to uh, close up this, uh, this webinar. And I'm very happy that you uh, all help us to develop the, all uh, the material, all this understanding, all um, uh, that very hot topic, which is the, uh, the movement from uh, the transition from the phase one and into phase two. So um, we have to thank, to thank you a lot, to thank all the faculty, all the very eager uh, participants that, uh, especially from Asia, that accepted to join us, uh, even if there it's uh, very late at night. Uh, and they took this um, invitation with a great commitment, with a great uh, effort and enthusiasm. And uh, we just organized in five days, probably less than five days. Andrew, what do you say? What do you say? And uh, it was fantastic gathering all this experience all together and having the chance also to compare to what's going on here in, um, in Europe, especially having the experience um, at this webinar, the experience of the most hit uh, countries uh, within Europe which is uh, good um, to compare for us. And um, we collected a lot of material. We learned uh, many, many uh, new things. And now I believe we have um, material enough to, uh, to develop a, um, some good, line, a good uh, guidelines. And um, so for you, probably uh, even down there in Asia, in Singapore, Hong Kong, Beijing, and um, um, in South Korea, it's time to uh, go to bed. Now for us in Italy, it, it's time to start working on this uh, knowledge you uh, gave us as a, as a gift and uh, to produce uh, some guidelines and that we hope to share soon with uh, all of you. And if uh, Andrew and Bo would like to have some um, uh, farewell words, I'm very happy again uh, to hear you and to share your, your your experience. And thank you, thank you again, Andrew. Well, thank you, uh, Andrea. And uh, on behalf of Asia, we want to thank the Italian Hand Society for graciously hosting this uh, webinar in such a short time. And uh, and thanks for your sharing because I think the European experience have also been very uh, invaluable in uh, in us trying to fight this uh, pandemic. And there are a lot of very good uh, points and very good uh, in, uh, data that you have shared, and we appreciate it very much. Bob, yes, please. Uh, thank you, Italian Hand Society, and Andrew and Andrew for this nice organization. And finally, I hope we can meet face in face in next meeting. Thank you both. Yes. Most certainly. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all, and for the Italian Commission for guidelines is the time to start working. Thank you everyone.